Okay, it's a little after nine o'clock, so we'll get started here. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to the Widener Commonwealth Law Review's annual symposium. Before I turn it over to Professor Family to introduce our first speaker, uh, I'd like to turn it over to the Dean of our law school, Michael Hussey, for uh, brief introductory remarks. Dean Hussey. Thank you, Daniel. Good morning. I'm Michael Hussey. I'm Dean of the law school. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our annual law review symposium. Our law review has put together a great program today on a topic of vital importance to our democracy. Voting rights have been discussed and debated in many fora for the past several years. Courts, federal and state, have issued decisions, and legislatures have promised to act, and some have already done so. Who we are as a country will be shaped by our voting rights. I am excited to learn today from our distinguished speakers, and I hope you are as well. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dean Hussey. Um, now may I introduce uh, Professor Jill Family, who will be introducing our first speaker. Hello, um, it's so wonderful to be here this morning as a part of this important discussion about voting rights. I'm Jill Family, I'm a professor at the law school as well as the faculty advisor to the Law and Government Institute. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Uh, Justice David N. Wecht was elected to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania in November 2015. And before that, he served as a judge of the Superior Court of Pennsylvania and also was a judge on the Court of Common Pleas for Pennsylvania's Fifth Judicial District. While he was a Court of Common Pleas judge, Justice Wecht served by appointment of the Supreme Court as administrative judge of the Fifth Judicial District's Family Division, which encompasses both domestic relations cases and cases of juvenile dependency and delinquency. As administrative judge, Justice Wecht designed and implemented several reforms and innovations, including the Unified Family Court, the Local Rule on Parenting Coordination, and improve conflict counsel appointments in juvenile cases. Justice Wecht is a summa cum laude Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Yale, where he was a National Merit Scholar and earned Yale College distinction in both history and political science, two subjects that are close to my heart as well. At the Yale Law School, Justice Wecht was selected as notes editor of the Yale Law Journal and as an editor of both the Yale Law and Policy Review and the Yale Journal of International Law. After graduating from the Yale Law School, Justice Wecht served as a law clerk to U.S. Circuit Judge George McKinnon on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit in Washington, D.C., and received the award for distinguished service in that position. Until he took the bench, Justice Wecht practiced law in Washington, D.C. and in Pittsburgh. A frequent lecturer to bench, bar, and community groups, Justice Wecht also has taught for many years at Duquesne University School of Law and at the University of Pittsburgh. Justice Wecht, have, has, Justice Wecht's writings have appeared in a number of publications, including the Yale Law Journal, the Pennsylvania Bar Quarterly, the Pennsylvania Lawyer, the Pennsylvania Family Lawyer, and the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Justice Weck also serves or has served as a fellow or member of several professional organizations, including the American Law Institute, the Allegheny County Bar Foundation, and the Executive Committee of the Pennsylvania Conference of State Trial Judges. He has volunteered his time to a number of governmental, civic, and community boards and groups including the Parent Education and Advocacy Leadership Center, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court's Domestic Relations Procedural Rules Committee, the Law Enforcement Advisory Committee of the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, the Criminal Justice Advisory Committee of the Community College of Allegheny County, the Juvenile Court Judges Commission, the Amen Corner, and others. So I'm going to turn it over to Justice Wecht in just a second, but I wanted to say that we do anticipate having time for questions. So when it comes time for questions, um, I will announce that it is time for questions. And if you could use the virtual raise hand feature 
I will then um, select you and, and be able to unmute you to ask your question. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Justice Wet. Thank you very much, Professor Family, Dean Hussey, uh, Daniel Martin for organizing this symposium. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. Uh, it would be it would be better, of course, if we could be together in person and hopefully we'll have a chance to do that. I've enjoyed being at your fine law school in the past and always found my, my uh, exchanges with students and faculty there really interesting and uh, very edifying. And of course, I think that all of these educational exchanges in which we can learn from one another are, are uh, optimal when we can be face to face and and I look forward to that and by the way that's just a little ad I'll, I'll offer since most of the people on this call are law students. Um, as an old person, I will give you my old person's advice which you didn't ask for, which is that you will advance more and faster as a lawyer, uh, regardless of what kind of law you practice or really regardless of what you do uh, when you do it in person and have the chance for serendipitous exchanges and conversations with peers and with elders um, and learn from their experiences, um, things that don't happen uh, coincidentally uh, when you're doing everything virtually. Um, my kids who are in your age group hear that from me constantly. So they're, they're always telling me to shut up. So you can uh, virtually tell me to shut up too, but that is my two cents on the issue of this uh, remote um, remote learning phenomenon, which apparently a lot of people, um, both in industry and in academia, don't want to leave behind. But I, I encourage you and your careers to get out there and uh, be involved face to face, and you'll see that your career will benefit uh, and you will benefit personally. All right, enough of that. Um, commercial advertisement, and now I'm jumping right to the subject. It's, it's wonderful to have a chance to talk about voting rights in elections. And I think, of course, that uh, you'll all agree that the topic could not be more timely, both from the perspective of, uh, of our nation and uh, our Commonwealth. And the, the, the first thing, I, I guess the first point I'd like to make is, is, is also an obvious one. Uh, and that is that we've seen a distinct rise in election related litigation. So recently uh, courts in Pennsylvania and across our country have seen really an unprecedented wave of disputes involving both the form and the function of our democratic contests uh, with an emphasis on voting itself. Way back in 2013, Professor Rick Hasen, who is a leading expert on election law, uh, way back then, almost 10 years ago, Professor Hasen uh, described the rate of election litigation as being high, uh, at more than double uh, what it had been in the period before the Bush versus Gore decision in 2000. The chart I'm showing here uh, is one of the illustrative uh, depictions presented by Professor Hazen. Uh, more recently, he has reported that we have hit record highs and that um, there were almost 26% more cases in 2020 than there were four years before in 2016. Now, this trend may have been a long time in coming uh, though I think we can say that it's been exacerbated by a number of factors, uh, including, and, and, and certainly uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but, and I'm sure we could probably come up with others, but a, a few things that play in are uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, that, this has implicated deadlines, uh, it's implicated absentee and mail-in ballot issues, uh, it's implicated voter access issues um, um, and um, related phenomena. Also, the Rucho versus Common Cause decision 
uh, from the Supreme Court of the United States a few years ago, which effectively uh, by five to four margin took the state, uh, I'm sorry, took the federal courts out of the uh, enterprise of resolving questions around partisan gerrymandering. Uh, leaving those claims uh, explicitly, as it were, to state courts. Now, I, I, I want to um, emphasize um, that Rucho took the federal courts out of uh, partisan gerrymandering, um, a, a question that had not been answered definitively by SCOTUS uh, before having been left open um, by decisions such as Veith versus Jubilee, or a case that originated in Pennsylvania. But Rucho closed that door. I want to emphasize, though, that the, um, the uh, federal courts remain open to claims of racial uh, gerrymandering, uh, claims that would implicate uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that would, in, that would implicate equal protection and due process clauses of our constitution. Um, but um, claims uh, arising uh, assertedly under any federal constitutional or statutory provision around partisan gerrymandering uh, are effectively foreclosed by Rucho. So in turn, um, this has exacerbated the um, flow of the gerrymandering cases in the state courts. Um, also playing into the phenomenon of the rising litigation are widespread claims of voter fraud, uh, of ballot tampering, um, and related uh, defalcations. Uh, also, um, partisan challenges to certification, to poll watchers, and the like. Now, uh, these statistics, as you can see from the slide, only run to 20 through 2020. So we can only wonder what the data might show after 2021 uh, and after 2022. Uh, and of course, we're, we're only a quarter into 2022 so far. Uh, but it would be fair to predict that when we see those numbers, that the rates will have continued to rise. Now, given these developments that I've been tracing, I think we would do well to reflect on the crucial, if often very reluctant role that courts have come to play uh, in resolving these issues that, that many have come to call the democracy docket. Uh, this leads me to my second point. The understandable judicial reluctance, and I would say the appropriate judicial reluctance to enmesh itself in adjudication of claims around partisan gerrymandering and around voting rights and election law generally cannot be allowed to precipitate complete and utter inaction. And in order to illustrate and explore this a little, I thought it would be useful to take us all the way back to 1946. So the war had recently ended and uh, a claim was brought in the uh, courts of Illinois, first in the state courts and then in the federal court um, out of Chicago, Illinois. Um, the case was called Colgrove versus Green, um, and it made its way to the Supreme Court of the United States. The uh, population of the state of Illinois had grown considerably, um, and the urban areas of Illinois had grown considerably in relative terms, uh, most particularly, of course, the uh, enormous city of Chicago. And this was um, reflective of a national trend that had been occurring since the turn of the century um, that the 
shift of population in our country uh, moving from rural to urban areas had become quite pronounced. And of course, the war effort had accentuated that um, along with um, the immigration prior to that. And the um, around the country, the legislative districts by and large, at least in many states, had, had not been adjusted to correspond to the census result, uh, including most specifically the rural to urban shift to which I just referred. In fact, in many places in our country, the results of the 1900 census were still being used in the formation of legislative districts. So I begin with this case of Colgrove versus Green. Uh, as a result of the population changes and the population growth, uh, the situation had arisen in Illinois uh, where one congressional district, for example, had a population of around 914 thousand people, uh, and another one had a population of around 112,000 people. Bear in mind, each of those two districts had the same representation in the U.S. House. That is to, that is to say they had one member of the U.S. House, notwithstanding that disparity. So that the voter in District A had about eight times the influence of a voter in District B. Now, the petitioners in that case thought that this violated the Equal Protection Clause. And you sitting there today, knowing the law as you do it, are probably nodding your head thinking, yeah, I think that sounds like an equal protection violation, but the Supreme Court of the United States uh, via a four vote plurality decided otherwise. Justice Felix Frankfurter wrote for the high court for the plurality that decided the case. Um, Justice Frankfurter thought that the issue was, quote, of a peculiarly political nature and therefore not meet for judicial determination, unquote. And for you young people out there, that's M-E-E-T, not M-E-A-T. People used to talk that way. It's a quaint usage, meet means appropriate. Okay. Justice Hugo Black dissented for three justices. He admitted that the constitution contained no express provision mandating that districts have equal population. But Black posited that it was implied that elections and election systems should be, quote, designed to give approximately equal weight to each vote cast, unquote. Now, Frankfurter's view that the courts could not adjudicate this and should not adjudicate this and that it was unduly political um, and therefore left to other branches drew a mountain of criticism from law professors and political scientists and others um, and it would eventually be overruled. But before we go there, I want to pause for a minute and articulate uh, why it is that in, with the benefit of hindsight, we can see that that decision was so profoundly incorrect. Uh, and, and, and that is because as the Supreme Court came to develop, came to develop in later um, cases, the Equal Protection Clause does indeed uh, require uh, rough equality in voting power in terms of the representation uh, in a legislative body. So what happened uh, is that a very interesting case arose in 1962, a case whose name will be familiar to some of you, Baker versus Carr. 
And the reason that it's probably familiar to some of you uh, is that some of you remember hearing or reading about something called the political question doctrine. So Baker versus Carr and then Reynolds versus Sims in 1964, uh, they may seem settled and foundational today, but they were controversial in their own right. And an interesting story has it that the Baker decision actually broke two justices. Um, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll get to that now. So when Baker came to the court, uh, and, and Baker came out of uh, Tennessee, um, and um, in that situation, similar to Colgrove, uh, there was an enormous disparity between the um, voting power of um, legislative districts. So um, that one involved the state Senate in Tennessee. And in, uh, the situation was that Memphis, Nashville, and Knoxville, by the time of Baker uh, and their surroundings, had about 63% of Tennessee's people, but they only had about, they only had 13 out of 33 state Senate seats. So almost two thirds of the people um, and um, little more than a third of the state Senate seats. So rural voters enjoyed uh, disproportionate clout. Anyway, so the, the court though, after hearing arguments was split about the proposition of overruling Colgrove, the plurality decision written by Justice uh, Felix Frankfurter um, pictured in the slide. Black and Douglas who had dissented in Colgrove uh, now had some uh, cavalry with them, the court's composition had changed. Uh, Earl Warren um, had joined the court, the Chief Justice, um, and William Brennan, uh, a former state court judge in New Jersey, was now on the court. Um, so Frankfurter, who had written Colgrove, uh, he cobbled together initially a coalition following the arguments in Baker with Justice John Harlan and Justice Tom Clark. Um, and those three were inclined to uphold Colgrove. They, um, they basically thought that no matter how terrible a situation the plaintiffs found themselves in, that situation could only be made worse by the judiciary stepping into what they regarded as a political thicket. Justice Charles Evans Whitaker, uh, pictured in the middle there, that's Chief Justice William O. Douglas on the other side, uh, Justice Whitaker and Justice Potter Stewart, who had joined the court, they were on the fence. So the court was divided at that point, and um, the case actually had to be re-argued. Um, Douglas and Frankfurter began to, and, and by the way, they were polar opposites jur jurisprudentially, um, and uh, they began to uh, bore in, on, to press in on Whitaker, pictured in the middle there. And in fact, it's kind of colorful history. According to Whitaker's granddaughter, Kate, Whitaker attended law school, and law school and high school at the same time. I have no idea how that's possible, but that was what his granddaughter said. And um, when he was a lawyer, he would practice oral advocacy by making arguments in front of farm animals. So interesting fellow. Now, after the first argument, of Baker, remember I told you it had to be re-argued because the court was deadlocked, just like Brown versus Board um, uh, six or so years before it had to be re-argued. Some accounts after that first argument have Frankfurter um, filibustering at the justices conference while looking straight at Whitaker. So it was a 
high pressure environment in the justices conference room, no doubt. At the second oral argument, Justice Frankfurter spoke about 170 times. So if you think Justice Breyer has long questions, for example, um, then you probably need to listen to a one of those secret recordings made um, of SCOTUS back in those days because it wasn't allowed. Um, but um, there is um, there are bootleg tapes. Um, you can buy them legally, legally. Um, and you can hear some of you can hear some of Frankfurter's questions. Anyway, Justice Whitaker was really torn. He was really torn. And he really didn't know what to do. Uh, he appreciated the arguments on both sides. For months, he, he agonized over it. This is even after even after the second argument. Um, eventually, he went to the middle of the woods in, in a cabin in Wisconsin with a friend, um, which was not unprecedented because Douglas would sometimes leave the court in June, even before all the decisions had rendered, and the marshal would have to find him out in the cascade somewhere and bring him down to the federal courthouse in Yakima or Spokane or whatever so he could turn in a vote. Um, in any event, so Whitaker had retreated to a cabin in the woods and ultimately Whitaker suffered a nervous breakdown. Uh, and he ended up recusing himself. Uh, he did not vote in the final Baker versus Carr. Uh, in, the, in the Baker, he didn't vote in Baker versus Carr. He didn't participate. Um, and he ended up, by the way, retiring from the court entirely uh, shortly after Baker was decided. Now, Stewart, Potter Stewart, broke uh, in favor ultimately of overturning Colgrove uh, and, and Clark, Justice Clark also flipped. So it turned out that Whitaker's vote uh, was ultimately not, uh, uh, not necessary um, for a majority to form in the case. Um, and the case um, went down six to two uh, in favor of the petitioners reversing Colgrove and determining that the malapportionment uh, in Tennessee uh, was, in fact, a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, and Baker versus, Baker versus Carr, um, written by Justice, the majority opinion written by Justice Brennan, there were other opinions in the case, uh, all of which I commend to your attention. Uh, Brennan's majority set forth in considerable detail and length the lineaments of the uh, political question doctrine. Um, he articulated, for example, six factors uh, which courts should look at um, and acknowledged in detail that there are matters that the judicial branch must stay away from, um, concluding ultimately that this was not one of them. And, and I, I think it's important to acknowledge that, of course, there's, there's that Justice Frankfurter's position is not without merit. Uh, judges in courts do have certain institutional handicaps when it comes to resolving these disputes. Um, they don't uh, uh, canvas public opinion. Um, they don't conduct longitudinal studies. Um, they don't start up research enterprises um, to survey data, et cetera. Uh, courts and judges are not political scientists, mathematicians, statisticians, uh, all of whom, of course, legislators can hear from and consider if they wish to do so. Uh, and of course, courts must be, and they must appear to be, neutral. So of course, then, we must and we can and we must debate the role of the courts in this new era where lawyers are as essential to campaigns as door knockers, as organizers, et cetera. Nonetheless, it's important that the way forward and that we agree that the way forward is not a return to Cole Grove versus Illinois. You see, if, if, if the alternative to the political thicket is turning a blind eye 
to the promises that we made to one another in our founding document, our constitution, and the democratic values that underlie everything government does, then that is really no alternative at all. Think of uh, any port in a storm. Without courts, we invite mischief and we allow political interests to play clever games. Clever games with our most fundamental right, the right to vote, the right that is really preservative of all of our other rights. This brings me to my, my final point. And that point is that consistent with Marbury versus Madison and its progeny, courts have legitimacy in doing this work and they can offer a level of transparency in adjudication that political processes cannot. Now, many, many current election challenges that we see in the state and federal courts and the media coverage of them have um, something of an undertone that uh, democratic legitimacy or um, um, sovereignty, as it were, exists primarily or exclusively in the legislative branch to the detriment of its sister branches, the executive and the judiciary. Take, for example, what's been called the independent state legislature doctrine, um, the doctrine that would argue that the state legislature and the state legislature alone uh, can and should play a role constitutionally in this equation. Um, that doctrine, by the way, uh, was uh, at least implicitly contradicted quite recently in the Supreme Court of the United States decision in the Arizona uh, legislative redistricting case of 2018 or 2019. Uh, but we'll hear and read more about that doctrine, uh, no doubt, in years to come, so stay tuned. Uh, of course, of the Supreme Court of the United States may, in its prerogative, return to that in one way or another, and it'll be interesting to see uh, what the High Court does. Now, journalists and pundits tend to count heads on courts and to do it uh, with a tool no, no finer um, than the crude instrument of the uh, party of registration of the president who appointed the um, federal judge or of the federal judge herself or himself or the registration of the um, judge or the party that nominated that judge in a state that elects its judges. And, and courts have faced criticism for decisions um, based on these party line type arguments from left or right. Certainly um, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania has not been immune from these kind of attacks, certainly following decisions um, arising during the, the election cycle in 2020, such as uh, Pennsylvania Democratic Party versus Bukvar um, and other cases that adjudicated claims that arose in the context of the pandemic and its effects on voting and on polling and on absentee ballots and the like, uh, courts have been painted uh, by critics in an activist light. And that's um, to be expected, of course, and courts are not immune from criticism. Um, it's also worth remembering that the Purcell Doctrine uh, emanating from the Supreme Court of the United States 2006 per curiam decision uh, with an interesting concurring statement by Justice John Paul Stevens does stand for the proposition that the closer, the closer the time comes to an election itself, the more hesitant courts should be in meddling 
uh, and should should default to the popular mandate that will be reflected in the vote itself um, and take the time to sort out constitutional or other legal claims uh, afterward when time permits. That's an important thing uh, for courts always to be mindful of. Now, in instances like this, scholars of Pennsylvania history would do well to think back, way back, to the Scottish-born Democrat, James Wilson. Uh, James Wilson is a very interesting person. Uh, he's often forgotten to history, and that's very unfortunate. Uh, he died in debtor's prison. And um, he is nonetheless one of only six people to sign both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Only six people signed both. And he also spoke the second most of any delegate at the 1787 Constitutional Convention, second only to Governor Morris. And Governor Morris pretty much spoke incessantly. In fact, if we could put Morris and Frankfurter together, it would have been it would have been impossible for anybody in the room probably to get a word in edgewise between those two uh, jurists. In 1776, and, and you may or may not be aware of this because our constitution goes back all the way back to the year of our independence, of our nation's independence, 1776. It's the, it is the parent, not the child of the United States constitution, which was not ratified till 1789. So in 1776, we had our first constitution. Benjamin Franklin played a major role, by the way, in that constitution. And we had a radically democratic constitution. We had a unicameral legislature and a pluralist executive. Now, you might think that James Wilson, who had advocated in Philadelphia for direct election of the president, would favor such a radically democratic constitution. But he actually opposed it. Wilson said that the executive branch and the judicial branch were also embodiments of the popular will, that the three branches had to be seen together, synthesized as our government of three independent branches. And here's what he said. I've reproduced it here. Wilson said, we hear the legislature mentioned as the people's representatives. The distinction, probably not avowed upon reflection, is that the executive and judicial powers are not connected with the people by a relation so strong or near or dear but we should look upon the different parts of government with a just and impartial eye. The executive and judicial powers are now drawn from the same source, are now animated by the same principles, and are now directed to the same ends with the legislative authority. They who execute and they who administer, i.e. adjudicate, the laws, are as much the servants and therefore as much the friends of the people as they who make them. And I think it's important to think about that because I think therein lies the basis for Baker versus Carr, for Reynolds versus Sims, which followed in and, and confirmed the principle of one person, one vote one person, one vote in 1964, um, and the uh, PDP versus Bookfar decision I mentioned, and our recent decision in Carter, uh, which I have not talked about. Uh, that's the congressional uh, reapportionment case we recently decided. 
Um, I think that that much of Wilson's wisdom uh, can be seen as we think about those decisions and what they stand for, to wit that courts have proven that they can arrive at workable, logical solutions and that they can do so within the proper bounds of judicial discretion. And with respect to those proper bounds, those limits of the judicial enterprise in these um, areas with such great political implications, this so-called political thicket, I think it's useful to reflect upon the least change discussion uh, in the various opinions for the court, for our court, in the Carter case recently, that is the congressional, the U.S. House redistricting uh, case. The discussion of the least change approach um, in that case uh, developed through the various opinions uh, why that is most consistent with the judicial role in the 20 um, in the 2020 uh, red or the, the redistricting and suing from the 2020 census. It, that is to say, not as a front end consideration, but as a means for court to cabin their review, um, a plus factor as it were, or a gut check factor uh, as it were. All in all, our reluctance and our limitations aside, Courts nonetheless have a constitutional command, a constitutional command running all the way from Marbury through Baker, all the way till today to our League of Women Voters decision in 2018, to our Carter decision in 2022, to be vigilant and skeptical of measures that threaten something as precious and as paramount as the legitimacy of our government and the right of the people to vote and the right of the people to, to free and equal elections. Now, having said that, I want to emphasize that scrutiny is important. For example, were courts to assume blindly that something like, say, incumbency protection, um, having been acknowledged by courts in the past as a consideration, um, becomes a a such a legitimate interest uh, that it puts that it puts other things in jeopardy, things of a constitutional dimension, constitutional ideals, then it's important to examine what harms might come along uh, with some plan that focused on incumbent protection. So courts have a mission um, and they should not fail their mission. They should fulfill their mission within the proper bounds uh, and limitations of the judicial enterprise. I um, look forward to participating in the cases that come to the court in this and other areas in the time um, that I serve on the court, recognizing that others served before and others will serve after. It's a pleasure to serve you on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. I thank you for the opportunity to talk with you and I'd be happy to address any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justice Weck. Um, we have about 15 minutes or so for questions. So if you could go ahead and use the virtual raise hand feature, if you have a question, um, I can go ahead and recognize you and um, let you ask a question. Maybe I'll get things started off and then I'll let give people a minute or two to figure out where the raise hand feature is. It's under reactions if you're using Zoom. Um, so Justice Weck, I thought that quote from James Wilson is, is super interesting and is something that I've always thought about in that why do we think of the judiciary as somehow lesser than. And it seems to me that, you know, if the theory is, well, judges are not elected, well, that's not true in Pennsylvania because our judges um, are elected. And so I'm wondering if you have any ideas on how we can better educate the public as lawyers as to why 
we should not view the judiciary as lesser than or a not as deserving component of the government? Uh, thank you, Professor Family. I think it's a, a terrific question. Uh, first of all, let me let me say, consistent with what what you pointed out there, um, that Pennsylvania is uh, a state that elects all of its judges at every level, and that the three appellate courts are elected statewide, so that any member of one of the three appellate courts, the Supreme Court, the Superior Court, the Commonwealth Court, uh, was elected uh, by the voters of Pennsylvania statewide, uh, which is important. And that is a product of the Jacksonian era. And um, many states, such as our neighbors in New York, for example, went back and amended their constitution after the Jacksonian era uh, to make their appellate jurists appointed. Pennsylvania did not. Uh, Pennsylvania did not. Pennsylvanians at their constitutional conventions and in the various amendments that happened over the intervening decades and centuries did not revert uh, to an appointive judiciary, but rather insisted that their judges be elected. Um, so that's important to reflect upon for whatever takeaway people might want to derive from it, number one. Number two, um, to your main point about the lack of understanding of the judicial role, I think this goes to civics education. And I think it's unfortunate that uh, so many people are not being taught uh, in school, in grade school, in high school, about the three branches of our government, about how they work, about the nation's founding, about the discussions uh, at the Constitutional Convention, about the Federalist Papers, and about the, the role uh, that all three branches have in our government, about federalism, about the balance of power between the state and national governments. These are very important things, and I'm, I'm afraid they've fallen by the wayside. Um, in service or in favor of what, I don't know, but I do note that social media has taken over. Um, it's, I think it's most unfortunate, and I think that, that uh, young people um, only have limited hours, and if most of the hours are dedicated to TikTok uh, and Instagram on their personal device, then they don't have time to read or learn about civics. Um, and I know I sound antiquarian um, and I acknowledge that. And um, I don't have a way to put that genie back in the bottle, uh, but I think I can still bemoan it. And um, this lack of civics education, unfortunately, um, being a widespread public phenomenon unfortunately manifests in legislative bodies, be they state or um, state or federal across our nation. Um, and we see that um, that as well. It's and, and executive branches, state and federal across our nation as well. It's most unfortunate. Now, the last thing I'll say on that is that lawyers have a role to play here. Um, judges uh, are limited in what they can do and say and uh, can't get up and hold press conferences responding to attacks on the judicial branch. But lawyers have a special role to play because they are not so muzzled um, and ought to be educating people about the role of the courts in protecting our liberties, safeguarding our constitutional rights and applying the rule, I mean, the rule of law uh, the rule of law is essential to our nation, and um, what lies beyond it is the rule of the mob. Thank you. Um, we have one question that came in uh, via chat, and then we, um, I want to say we especially welcome questions from any of the students that are attending. Don't feel like um, 
your questions are not welcome. We would love to hear your questions too. So the question in the chat says, Wilson's quote seems to imply that justices serve the people rather than the constitution. How does a judge balance these two entities? That's a great question. I, and, you know, as I was thinking about this talk and as I was looking over again and again at Wilson's comment, um, I was thinking about that too. So kudos to the questioner on that. Um, because in fact, um, though elected by the people, um, at least at one level of abstraction, we don't serve the people. We serve the constitution and laws. So the oath we take it is not to the people, it's to the constitution and laws. And why is that? Well, at any given moment in time, a popular majority, if one could poll it, might not approve the constitution or any of its provisions, or for that matter, any particular law passed by the legislature. And yet the judges are sworn to uphold the constitution and the laws. So uh, in that sense, though elected by the people um, and paid by the people, we are not serving the people, we are serving their constitution and their laws, um, but at another level of abstraction, that is the people because the constitution is our constitution. We come together to constitute a government, a government of three branches, and we set out in that compact what the rights and duties and limitations are uh, in, that, in that government. And the laws, of course, are passed by the people that we elect to the, the legislative branch and executed uh, by the person we elect to lead the executive. So um, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. It's a very apt question. Um, and I, I think it can be looked at on those, at least those two planes of analysis. Other questions? Uh, Daniel, go ahead. Thank you, Professor. And uh, again, thank you, Justice Wecht. Uh, it was a fascinating um, presentation. I do have a question uh, going back to the idea of the democracy docket. So as a justice, how do you balance uh, the judicial reluctance to wade into the legislative process with also uh, the dangers of inaction, um, protecting voting rights in any specific district? Is there uh, a test that you apply, that you look for in each case, or is it more you know, totality of the circumstances um, under a case-by-case -case basis? So, so the, uh, thank, thank you, Daniel. Daniel. The, the, the test, test has to be, is, is there a colorable claim under the Constitution and laws? Uh, if, if there isn't, um, well, first, first, of course, our first question is jurisdiction. jurisdiction. Um, and, and then, of course, if, if we pass through that, that gate, we, we come to the question of justiciability. Um, and, and most pertinently, in the realm of justiciability, we, we must address the political question doctrine set forth in Baker versus Carr um, and its progeny. Um, and the, um, the uh, internal workings of a political party, for example, would tend to um, take us into the political thicket, right? Uh, and raise political question concerns. We did have a recent case called, um, oh my goodness, I, I don't think it was Batman. I think we talked about the Batman case. Um, and, and I'm sorry that I'm forgetting it, but we had a recent case where we addressed a um, um, we addressed this issue in the context of um, I think a party committee seats or something of the like. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just drawing a blank. Um, but, but you see, see the, those, those kinds of cases, cases um, are, are are cases that courts have to walk very gingerly on. Uh, in contradistinction, I think, to the kinds of cases we're talking about here, which clearly are raising claims uh, of constitutional magnitude, claims that have been thought justiciable since Colgrove was uh, overturned. Um, 
uh, and or claims that allege a violation of statute or or, cha- or, or a, an arguable conflict between a statute and a constitutional provision. Uh, so the uh, interestingly enough, the the question of whether the court should hear a case, um, though though maybe one that's raised by um, critics in the public sphere is not has not really been a close legal question in the controversies that I can think of in recent years. If you follow what I'm saying, um, the court's decisions, whether our court or other state and federal courts around the country, are widely criticized as as one would expect in a democracy such as ours. Um, but, but but really not on coal grove grounds. If you can follow what I'm saying, that we sort of, um, insofar as I can recollect, left behind the coal grove abstention arguments um, and moved into other areas of dispute. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Justice Wax. Um, we are exactly on time. So please join me in giving some virtual claps um, to <laughs> Justice Wax. Thank you so much for joining with us this morning. We hope you have an excellent weekend. And Daniel, I'll throw things back to you. Thank you. Good, Good luck, luck with, with your program. program. Thank you, Justice Wax. All right, that concludes our first panel. Uh, If you're sticking around, we have a 15 minute break and then we will be moving on to uh, our second panel. Um, So thank you all for attending. I hope to see you at the next one. Started here in just a minute or two, give people a a couple more uh, minutes to sign on.
Okay, everyone, we're going to get started here with our next panel. Uh, welcome back. And if you're just joining us, thank you for attending uh, the annual uh, Widener Commonwealth Law Review Symposium. I am going to be introducing each of our speakers in turn. Our first speaker is Speaker of the House Brian Cutler. Uh, speaker Cutler is serving his eighth term in the Pennsylvania General Assembly, uh, represents the 100th legislative district serving Lancaster County. He was unanimously elected Speaker of the House on January 5th, 2021, and is the 139th Speaker in the history of Pennsylvania's House of Representatives. Speaker Cutler graduated summa cum laude from Lebanon Valley College with a healthcare management degree. Following several years of working at a local hospital overseeing budgets and daily operations of several sections in the radiology department, successfully pursued a law degree focused on healthcare law from Widener Law School. The desire to give back to the community, which did so much for him and his family, drove Mr. Cutler to run for public office and was elected in 2006. Speaker Cutler was elected majority whip for the 2015 and 2016 and also the 2017 and 2018 sessions. For the 2019 and 2020 session, Speaker Cutler was elected majority leader where he helped lead one of the most successful sessions in modern history, which included expanding workforce educational opportunities across the Commonwealth, providing for new paths for attracting and retaining EMS and other first responders and establishing a statewide health insurance exchange, which has proven to lower costs for insurance consumers in the Commonwealth. His legislative achievements have all received strong bipartisan support and are a sign of his willingness to work together for the best interests of Pennsylvanians. Please welcome Speaker Brian Cutler. Thank you, Daniel. I'll apologize up front. I know we're having some regional network issues. So if my video uh, and audio starts to get choppy, just let me know and I'll, I'll cut the video feed so we can uh, get to the questions and answers. Um, you know, first of all, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. It's always good to come back um, at the risk of showing my age. When I went to Widener uh, Law School, it was still the combined but two state uh, campus system uh, in terms of uh, sister campuses. So it's good to be back. And I uh, certainly enjoyed my time there and, and the opportunities that I had such as this when I was enrolled. I figured I'd give a real brief uh, overview of Act 77, uh, specifically what uh, election changes occurred, uh, and then also really uh, spend some time highlighting a lot of the litigation that went on, because I'm not sure that even as attorneys, we all followed exactly uh, what happened in terms of both the challenges to Act 77 itself, as well as some of the elections. Uh, that had been run under it. Uh, and I happen to know because as speaker, I am the named party in almost uh, all the lawsuits. Anytime that the house is named in an action, it is always uh, my name who is at the top. Uh, we get served probably about once a week in some capacity when the house gets sued. Uh, so I've become uh, intimately familiar with all of our legal counsel and uh, our outside counsel as well. Um, you know, Act 77 was the first time in uh, over eight decades that the election laws uh, had really been updated. Uh, there were a series of things that were changed at that time. Uh, one of those was to update and clean the voter rolls consistent with state and federal law. It was brought to our attention that many of the counties were not always following those laws as was required. Uh, so while we were also appropriating money to the counties to fund the voting machines uh, that had been recently decertified unilaterally by the governor. Uh, we said that you must comply and show proof of complying with all the state and federal voting roll requirements. Uh, that is uh, something that each of our counties do and uh, they did and under Act 77. It also had uh, mail-in balloting, uh, which was run parallel to the absentee balloting. Uh, it had the same security features. In fact, uh, when that law was originally drafted, uh, they literally lifted the sections out of the absentee ballot, created the new section called mail-in ballot and put the same language in. So much so that they actually transferred a typo, which we had to, to fix uh, later uh, with a follow-up trailer bill uh, to make it uh, actually reflect what the law was supposed to say. Uh, in terms of what I'll call post-election requirements, we also required data sets to be collected. Knowing that mail-in ballots was going to be new, we wanted to follow and see, you know, how are they used? Were they used successfully? What were the challenges? 
uh, both from a voter user standpoint as well as the county because there were some administrative changes. We also went from a 30 day uh, requirement to be registered down to a 15 day requirement uh, pr pr prior to the election. So all of those changes needed to be tracked. We needed to understand the difficulty in which uh, that, uh, you know, that might be implemented. And we had that first report that was issued. Uh, there were challenges that were noted at the county level. Uh, in particular, there, there was ballots mailed out that were never returned. There were ballots that were mailed out that were late. There were challenges with getting the voter books out to the other uh, you know, the polling stations. Uh, for those unfamiliar who have never worked a poll before, you are flagged in the poll book if you have requested an absentee or a mail-in ballot so that you do not double vote and that you you know, can't vote by mail and then also vote in person. Uh, those are still actual books uh, that are that are printed. And there have been some discussion about turning that into an electronic version, uh, but that also obviously would require additional funding and uh, the, we'd need to work with the counties on that. Uh, once the report came out, there became a flurry of lawsuits. And I think that it's important to kind of, of highlight this. Uh, because the lawsuits were really targeted at many of the challenges that were encountered during that process. There were more than 20 at, uh, at last count uh, that we were either party to or uh, you know, we filed uh, briefs on behalf uh, of different issues. Our main position consistently as, you know, as the speaker and leader of the House Republicans was simply follow the law as written. Uh, you know, follow the security measures, follow the deadlines. Uh, but systematically, and it started with the, the Democratic Party of Pennsylvania filed a lawsuit against the state uh, secretary, uh, it said, well, we, we have concerns. And those concerns that were raised were really uh, around the deadline itself. Uh, there were lawsuits challenging the 8 p.m. deadline. And for us, when we passed the bill, one of the things was consistency across all forums. You know, if I'm driving to the polling station, but I don't get in line until 8.01, it doesn't matter that I was in route, it matters what time I got there and what time I'm in line. And unfortunately, that one was ultimately taken the whole way to the United States Supreme Court, and we lost twice uh, because the court said that you could accept ballots up to three days after. Uh, for me personally, the most egregious part of that ruling was it did not require a postmark. Uh, so there was no proof that it was mailed by a certain date, and that was an issue that we raised. Now, to be very clear, that was uh, we did get a court order segregating those ballots. So it's about 9,700 ballots. And while it didn't impact any of the statewide races, it did most certainly impact a senatorial race out in western Pennsylvania, which was the Nicole Ziccarelli and Jim Brewster race. In fact, uh, the Senate did not initially seat him while the litigation was ongoing. And you know, for us, the law was very clear. It was unambiguous. And unfortunately, the court, I think, strayed off the plain meaning of the statute, uh, which is something that I know that we all studied during law school. And when you look at it, uh, in particular in that case, uh, they said the deadline won't matter this one time. It will only matter going forward. And we have actually won two subsequent cases, uh, one in Philadelphia, one in the Lehigh Valley, where individuals wanted to count and certify an election with undated or late ballots, and the law was upheld as written. Uh, so I think that there's some fundamental inconsistencies uh, in, our, in our prior case law, which when you have that level of uncertainty, it will only beg uh, future litigation. When, uh, when you look at the results or as the election law was implemented, it was fundamentally different than what was passed and signed into law by the governor. Uh, it created drop boxes, which were created, you know, they weren't mentioned anywhere in the code. Uh, they extended the deadline. I mentioned the postmark piece. Um, the counties also asked for notice and opportunity to cure, which is not currently allowed under the law. That is something that we did pass legislation on. The governor, unfortunately, vetoed. And uh, we also, for those who may not be familiar with the system, we have a secrecy uh, guarantee on our election code and our constitution. And so when you fill out your, your absentee or mail-in ballot, you put it in a secrecy envelope, which you then put in the mail-in envelope uh, and you sign it. And uh, those signature requirements were waived uh, for the elections uh, because they were challenged. I do think that there's potentially some inconsistency issues between in-person voting where we still sign the books and that is still checked versus absentee ballots. Um, but I think that maybe some of the other lawyers will, will talk about that later in the panel. And so for us, it's created a lot of uncertainty, both as 
policymakers as well as voters. Uh, we have passed a total of five election bills that have been signed into law. Uh, several more have been vetoed. Uh, so I certainly understand why uh, the election code was not touched in the last 80 years, uh, given how the statute has evolved uh, through the court's interpretation. And, you know, as we go forward, we're going to keep working on that. That's very important to me uh, because I do believe that elections are the bedrock of our democratically elected government. And when you when you look at that, it's very important that we have certainty and we have predictability. Uh, and I'll, I'll just close with this because of the nature of the lawsuits and because of the long window of mail in balloting, uh, you know, you that process, we're actually in it right now for uh, the upcoming primary election. It starts 50 days out. And what that means is the rules were literally changed in the middle of voting and as we progress forward. And I just think that's fundamentally unfair uh, and we shouldn't, that should not have happened. Uh, so we'll keep working on the statute. We'll keep passing bills. Hopefully we'll find some agreeable compromise on that. Uh, Act 77 itself was a bipartisan bill. All but two Republicans supported it and about a third of the Democrats supported it. And uh, you know, I think that those bipartisan solutions can continue to be found uh, as we go forward. So thank you very much, Daniel, and thank you for your time. And I'll go ahead and uh, wait for the questions here at the end. Thank you very much, Speaker Cutler. Uh, yes, as uh, Speaker just uh, reiterated, we will hold questions as we did with the uh, first panel until all speakers have uh, had their opportunity uh, to speak. Uh, our next speaker joining us uh, is Representative Donna Bullock. Uh, State Representative Donna Bullock is a member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, representing the 195th Legislative District in North and West Philadelphia. Uh, Representative Bullock won the seat in a special election held on August 11, 2015. A lawyer and Temple alumna, uh, class of 2004, uh, Representative Bullock previously served as Special Assistant to Philadelphia City Council President Daryl L. Clark and as the City Council Research Fellowship Director. She joined Clark's office in January 2011 as his Community and Economic Development Coordinator. Before her work for the city, Representative Bullock worked at a private law firm and for Philadelphia Community Legal Services, where she formed and advised nonprofit organizations, small businesses, and community groups. Representative Bullock's public service pre uh, precedes her work in government. She has volunteered and served on several boards, tech, task forces, and coalitions, including the Smith Memorial Playground and Columbia North YMCA Advisory Board, West Philadelphia Child Care Network, and the Mayor's Office of Community Service Advisory Board. Currently, she serves as chair of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus, as well as serves on the House Committees of Appropriations, Consumer Affairs, professional licensure and urban affairs. She and her husband, Otis Bullock, a lawyer and Temple alum as well, live a life of service in Strawberry Mansion, a community they are proud to call home. Please welcome Representative Donna, Donna Bullock. Thank you, Daniel, for that warm introduction and for this opportunity uh, to speak uh, to you this, this morning. First, I'd like to thank our speaker Cutler for um, outlining a lot of the uh, bullet points for Act 77 and some of the um, actions that were taken after the 2020 election. Uh, for me, as chair of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus, I find it important for me to talk about how I viewed some of the um, actions, not just during 2020 or post-2020 election, but really to look at the history of voter bills and, and what I will say voter disenfranchisement in Pennsylvania, particularly as it relates to Black voters, um, because I don't think we can talk about 2020 without talking about that history. You know, Pennsylvania has a history actually of being somewhat progressive early on when it came to voter rights and allowing Black voters to participate in that um, in that exercise. And uh, our 1790 constitution um, did not explicitly deny the vote to Black Pennsylvanians. And many Black Pennsylvanians did in fact participate in voting um, in the early parts, of, uh, early time of our, our Commonwealth. Um, however, as, as uh, time progressed and Black voters became more engaged and started to um, use that power to, to impact voting. Um, and in particularly in the 1830s, as they were 
hosting several um, the, the Philadelphians, Black Philadelphians were actually hosting national Black conventions right here in Philadelphia to talk about the um, agenda for Black, not just Black Pennsylvanians, but uh, Black Americans across this country at a, at a time when, um, particularly in the North, more and more free Blacks um, were um, settling and becoming part of society. They were be starting to own businesses and pay taxes and be very much a part of the Philadelphia and Pennsylvania economy and, and really believe that they uh, should have those right to vote and were ex exercising that right. Um, as this was happening in 1930, I mean, sorry, in 1838, um, Pennsylvania had its 1838 convention, and at that convention, uh, explicitly, explicitly denied the right to vote uh, to Black Pennsylvanians and restricted that right to just free white men. And it was the first time I think that we did as a Commonwealth explicitly restrict the right to vote. Um, it's the first time that uh, this disenfranchisement was happening. Um, black men did not gain that vote back until 1870 with um, the 15th Amendment. And of course, Black women um, did not see their voting rights um, really until um, not only after the 19th Amendment, but really until after the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And so um, we see this history, not just here in Commonwealth, but across the, the country of Black voters engaging and when they do engage that right being restricted. I just want to point that out because that happened in the 1830s here in Pennsylvania. As more Black folks started to exercise their right, it was pulled back. Um, then we see this again, I will say, in 2012 when voter ID laws are in the Commonwealth. Um, became a thing, uh, were passed. Um, the voter ID laws were passed um, right here in the Commonwealth and signed into law by then Governor Corbett. Um, and that was the most restrictive voter right, um, voter ID law um, in the country. Uh, in 2014, that law was found unconstitutional. Um, and, it, and, and we've seen since then, I think several attempts uh, by folks in the legislature to uh, figure out how to get around the, um, the court's decision, how to correct um, in some way uh, legislation so that it will pass constitutional muster and, um, and, and have voter ID law here in the Commonwealth. Then in 2019, as Speaker Cutler mentioned, we passed a sweeping legislation that really overhauled uh, elections and voting here in the Commonwealth. And he very eloquently laid out <laughs> many of the aspects of Act 77. And, and, and at the time, it had bipartisan support, as the speaker mentioned. Um, it was seen as a way to, to expand voter access to many folks. I actually voted against the bill because it also ended uh, straight ticket party voting, which I thought would be a disenfranchisement to many urban voters and uh, voters of color, uh, voters who may have literacy issues, and voters that I knew frankly relied on straight ticket party voting to get um, in, in the um, general elections to vote their conscience and vote the way they wanted to vote was with, which is with their party. Um, and so I voted against the bill for that reason. And, and as um, many election bills came before us then, before then and after, what we find is that those bills, while there may be one piece that speaks to you, there is one aspect that will expand voter access or may address some of the concerns around election integrity. There's often another part of that bill that does the exact opposite and rolls back voter rights or um, restricts voter rights in other ways. And so we're often as legislators put in this position to make a decision and to value or, or balance um, where you, you know, what, what you would like to see in, in a true voter reform or election reform bill. So 2019, we passed this bill. And then in 2020, we we're faced with a pandemic and there was an overwhelm, overwhelming number of folks who relied on vote by mail 
to cast their ballot during the 2020 elections. I think so much so that it overwhelmed a lot of our county election, um, county offices. And, um, and, and it became public enemy number one, I'll be honest. And, and, and my colleagues on the other side of the aisle began to attack vote by mail ballots. We've seen a number of attempts both um, locally and nationally um, talking about the process in which vote by mail was um, carried out, um, the integrity of vote by mail, and some of that was reflected in some of the lawsuits referenced by the speaker. Um, others were, some of it was just um, discussed in the public realm and media and elsewhere. Um, and, and really, um, what I seen, and particularly on the night of the election as a Black voter here in Pennsylvania, was an, another attempt to, to attack Black voters because what we seen on election night in 2020, whether you were in Philadelphia, Detroit, or, or Atlanta, major cities, urban centers, where the majority of the voters are Democratic, where there's a significant number of Black voters, Black and Brown voters, we saw folks attempting to stop those vote counts, attempting to discredit the votes that were being turned in in those particular areas. Uh, and for me, as a not just as a legislator, but as a, as a voter here in the Commonwealth, as a Black person in this nation, I saw in real time uh, an, an attempt to intimidate Black voters from casting their ballot in an, in an attempt to discredit those votes once they were counted. Um, or as they were being counted and as they made a difference in that election. And so after 2020, we enter 2021 with a number of bills being uh, introduced across the Commonwealth, not just here in the Commonwealth, but across the country um, that addressed election integrity, um, many of which I would uh, cast not as election integrity, but as uh, voter suppression um, and some, some some bills that looked familiar, a resurgence of voter ID, um, looking at uh, the ways to uh, restrict voter turnout or to intimidate voters that um, are attempting to register or cast their ballot. And so these are concerns as we reviewed these bills in the last year and a half. Uh, there were several hearings by our state government committee in Harrisburg to review, I believe, dozens of bills, maybe close to 50, um, that were introduced here just in the Commonwealth. Uh, one of the bills that I support wholeheartedly is a bill introduced by leader Joanna McClinton, um, the K. Leroy Irvis Voting Rights Protection Act, House Bill 2090. And that bill does include many of the things I heard Speaker Cutler say he would be supportive of. Um, but I, I'll just briefly say, uh, list some of those things that are in the bill and, um, and then I'll close with that. But so Leader McClinton's bill intro, uh, introduced as House Bill 2090 includes early day, early, I'm sorry, early voting, uh, establishes early voting locations for 15 days leading up to the election and, to, and which allows voters to cast their ballot on their own schedule. It also allows for same day voter registration on election day, a best practice for increasing participation in election in, um, in at least 18 states. It also implements statewide electronic poll books for secure real time monitoring of election rolls. And this is also used in at least 35 other states. It allows voters to cure de defects in submitting ballots so that voters are not disenfranchised by small errors in filling out their ballot. In addition, it will allow the legislation, um, this legislation will also allow counties to place ballots received without a secrecy envelope to then be able to place those in a new envelope to preserve the secrecy of that ballot. The legislation will require each county to have at least two ballot drop boxes, plus at least one for every 50,000 residents. And counties will also be required to provide a drop box on campus for each public university and community college with 10,000 students and within one mile of campus if the public university or community college has at least 5,000 students. It will set uniform requirements for signage, security, 
in the chain of custody for, um, for drop boxes. It will increase poll worker pay to improve participation and retention of our poll workers. And this is perhaps one of our biggest crises in elections right now is the, the limited number or the, the loss of poll workers to work on election day. It will make numerous changes uh, that were requested by our county elected officials, including a 21 day pre-canvassing um, uh, time and as well as other adjustments to mail in applications uh, to their deadlines. Um, it will provide for prepaid postage on your uh, ballot so that you can return your ballot without any cost. It would allow 16 and 17 year olds to pre-register to vote so that they will be able to vote once they turn 18 without much um, uh, concern or, or any hassle. And lastly, it will require colleges and universities to serve as a National Voting Rights uh, Act voter registration agency that, so that they can assist students right on campus and others on campus with their voter registration um, and other voter registration questions. I believe that the Kaylee Way Irvis Act is a great opportunity for us um, to uh, be able to, uh, to to move forward. And um, I think it, it's, it's a time for us to move forward as opposed to rolling back election laws. Thank you very much. I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Representative Bullock. Okay, moving on to our next speaker, um, is speaker Thomas W. King III. Mr. King is a graduate of the University of Virginia and Dickinson School of Law. He's admitted to the bar in 1975. He is also admitted to the U.S. Supreme Court, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, the Commonwealth Court, Superior Court, the Third Circuit uh, District Court, as well as the Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Uh, Mr. King was named a Pennsylvania super lawyer every year from 2004 through 2020, rated A by Martindale Hubble Loyal Rating Service, 1986 through 2020, uh, Governor Thornburg appointed member, 1983, and chairman of the trial court uh, nominating commission for Butler County. Uh, governor, he is also a Governor Ridge appointed co-chair of the trial court nominating commission for Butler County. Uh, a member of the Federal Judicial Nominating Committee, also a member of the Butler County, um, Pennsylvania, and American Bar Associations. He is a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers since 2005, uh, also serves general counsel, the Republican Party of Pennsylvania, elected member of the Republican State Committee, elected delegate to the Republican National Convention. Mr. King is also general counsel of the Pennsylvania Sheriff's Association the former member and chair of the Hearing Committee Disciplinary Board of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, and also served a general counsel of Ag Choice Farm Credit in Pennsylvania and West Virginia. Please welcome Mr. Thomas King. Thank you very much, Daniel. It's a real pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, I enjoyed uh, listening to uh, Mr. Justice Wecht um, give his very fine comments, and um, I'd like to thank Widener University for sponsoring this forum. I'm happy to be part of it. Um, the speaker's comments were particularly appropriate this morning. And I also enjoyed uh, listening to Representative Bullock's comments, uh, um, and some of which I happen to actually agree with, uh, and, and some of which I don't. <laughs> so I suspect she agrees with some of mine, will agree with some of mine and not with, with others. Um, so it's, it's been a real pleasure. Um, speaking of Act 77, before I I'll digress a little bit, um, speaking of Act 77, I recently had the pleasure of appearing uh, before Justice Wecht and the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, arguing that Act 77 um, is um, unconstitutional. Um, I was uh, uh, one of the uh, lawyers presenting that case um, alongside a couple of uh, really distinguished individuals. Um, your professor, Mike Domino of, of, of Widener University, uh, was one of the uh, presenters, uh, made the first argument. and. Uh, um, accorded himself exemplarily well uh, in, in the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Um, he was all, and on the other side of the fence, uh, we had the honor of appearing um, alongside uh, Seth Waxman, who is uh, the former Solicitor General of the United States. 
um, who was one of our opponents in that case. And so it was a real privilege to appear alongside both of them. Um, I argue for the fact that the uh, that Act 77 is unconstitutional, um, but that's not my topic today. Um, but it but it plays into my topic. And so um, I wanted I wanted to thank uh, the university and and uh, all of those folks for their for their uh, speeches this morning. Um, Speaker Cutler um, is a, a brilliant lawyer and a and a, and a really um, admirable uh, person to observe in in action as Speaker of the House of Representatives. And I had the pleasure of watching the Speaker um, engage as a, a lawyer in in the uh, regulatory review commission in the recent case that we were involved in which involved the um, legality of the uh, and the implementation of regulations involving masking in schools in Pennsylvania, a case that I'm proud to say we won six to nothing in the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. We won unanimously in the Supreme Court. The speaker um, actually in a, in a rare appearance in the, in the Regulatory Review Commission appeared um, and argued against uh, uh, that uh, regulation. So I wanted to move on. I'll, I'll move on this morning to my topic, um, uh, which I chose. And Daniel, I think you're going to assist me. I wanted to show some of the um, examples of things that, that relate to the infusion of, of uh, public money into our Pennsylvania elections. This is a topic that has a widespread um, uh, debate across the United States. Um, I also want to say, um, for, for full disclosure, that I am uh, one of the lawyers for the uh, Thomas More Society on the Amistad Project, which has been deeply involved across the United States in uh, legal actions involving the uh, legality of the infusion of private funds into public elections. Um, in particular, in, in Pennsylvania, um, we brought an action, uh, which was before Judge Braun up in the uh, United States District Court in Williamsport, and that action, um, if you're interested, you can find that at 496 Fed Supplement 3rd, 861. It's a 2020 case. Um, it's called Pennsylvania Voters Alliance versus Center County et al. One of the, um, uh, the other et al's are Delaware County and, and uh, um, Chester County, uh, Philadelphia County. And so uh, there were a number of, uh, of excellent lawyers on both sides of that issue. Um, that case was brought in 2020 um, which was the start of the challenge to the infusion of the Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Patricia Chen money into um, the election process, not only in Pennsylvania, but across the United States. So that uh, when we look back and we see um, how this thing started, and, and, uh, it, and this raises several um, distinct questions under Pennsylvania law, as well as under, under the Voting Rights Act, and as, as well as under uh, HAVA, so uh, you, you get into um, how did this thing start? And so um, in Pennsylvania, we see, and some of these documents were received by us in the, in the case um, in front of Judge Braun. The first one that Daniel has on the screen is a memorandum from Christine Ruther, who is a Democratic member of the Delaware County Council um, regarding Delaware County's request to um, a, a 501c3 uh, organization called the CTCL, the Center for uh, Tech uh, uh, Life, uh, Center for Tech and Civic Life, CTCL. And so the Center for Tech and Civic Life was the recipient of the Zuckerberg money, um, initially $250 million, um, ultimately another hundred, over 100 uh, million ad additional dollars were infused. And ultimately the um, Zuckerberg money that came into the 2020 election um, was was equal to the amount of money dedicated across the United States by private funding. For example, in Philadelphia alone, the budget for uh, the 2020 fall election was 9.8 million. The grant from CTCL to Philadelphia was 10 million dollars. So that the so that the funds in Philadelphia doubled by the infusion of private money uh, being infused by Zuckerberg. Uh, this is an example of, of someone um, applying for a grant, um, and these grants were, were supposedly for the purpose, and I will uh, read to you from uh, the Justice Gableman report, and by the way, if you're interested, uh, there is a, um, an, a very extensive report prepared by Justice Gableman, uh, he's a former justice of the Wisconsin Supreme Court, 
um, as you can find it readily online. Justice Gableman has uh, uh, issued a report uh, in Wisconsin called the Second Interim Investigative Report on the Apparatus and Procedures of the Wisconsin Election System. This was delivered uh, to the Wisconsin State Assembly on March 1st. And uh, Justice Gableman uh, reflected in that report uh, this release, which came out from, uh, from the CTCL in July of 2020. CTCL, and I'm quoting, CTCL is providing support to Wisconsin election officials, so no voter is required to make a choice between their health and their ability to vote. Um, allegedly, these funds were going to address the pandemic issues that, had, that, uh, that were, that were um, going to impact uh, voting across the United States. Most of this money went into the so-called battleground states, and uh, about $22 million of this money came into Pennsylvania. Um, to over $10 million came into Philadelphia alone. Uh, there were also substantial grants to Allegheny County, which is Pittsburgh, um, and the collar counties around Philadelphia, including Chester, Bucks, um, and Delaware and Montgomery. Um, those monies were used ultimately um, for purposes that, uh, in my view, had little to do with, um, with, the, with uh, the pandemic uh, and much more to do with uh, getting out the vote. Um, this is uh, what uh, Daniel is showing you now, and these are documents I supplied to Daniel to ask him to put up on the screen. So what, uh, what you're looking at now is uh, a letter uh, from uh, the CTCL to Philadelphia. This forms the basis of the contract. So there's a contract between Philadelphia and CTCL. There's a contract between Delaware County and CTCL, et cetera. There's a contact between Center County and, and CTCL. So each of these counties had an individual contract. I'll go through this quickly, but the, you can see that the amount of the grant, so-called so grant, was over $10 million. The purpose was that the grant funds must be used exclusively for the public purpose of planning and oper operationalizing safe and secure election administration in the city of Philadelphia in accordance with the attached Philadelphia safe voting plan. Daniel, if you could scroll through this a little bit, um, you can see that um, the city will endeavor to expend grant funds pursuant to uh, the plant part of the plan called mail-in and absentee equipment on the, on the items listed in the plan. So this contract was, uh, in my view, um, and in many people's view, um, had little to do with the pandemic and everything to do with getting out the vote in the blue air in the blue areas and again i've disclosed i'm the general counsel of the republican party for pennsylvania but um, this contract had everything to do with getting out the vote in the blue areas um and in, and in many instances to the to the uh um to to ignore um getting out the vote in red areas so the city agreed in section six daniel if you will the city and the city commissioners have submitted to cccl a plan which included so-called satellite election offices and ballot drop-off auctions. Um, when the speaker spoke this morning, you're talking about Act 77, what it provided for. These are not things that were, that were originally provided for in Act 77. These were things that evolved out of Act 77 and out of the expenditure of funds by people like CTCL, creating these so-called satellite election offices and ballot drop-off boxes. Um, these were not things envisioned by Act 77 in its, in its origin. Um, the city um, has to, under this agreement, communicate any changes from this section, um, including any reduction in the plan number operating hours or, or operating dates of satellite election centers to the grantor. So CTCL uh, controlled uh, by virtue of this contract with Philadelphia, and these contracts are all the same with, with the other counties, um, controlled uh, by virtue of, the, of making this money available and the city of Philadelphia using it, they controlled the number of, uh, uh, of polls that would be open. They also controlled uh, by, by suggesting, and I'll show you in a minute, um, a clawback provision that says that Philadelphia has to pay this money back if they, don't, uh, if they don't fulfill the obligations that they entered into. The city and the commissioners, uh, and those are, the, those are the, the former county commissioners who are now in Philadelphia served the singular purpose of running elections, the city and the commissioners have submitted a plan which includes secure drop boxes. These drop boxes are, have become highly controversial. In Delaware County alone, there were more drop boxes in Delaware County in 2020 
than in the entire uh, rest of the state of Pennsylvania. Um, Daniel, if you'll scroll down a little bit more, please. <clears throat> you'll see um, that in section three, the city of Philadelphia agreed to maintain a certain number of polling places. Um, this was critically important in Philadelphia with respect to getting out the vote of the Democratic Party because there were often difficulties in Philadelphia to man that number of polling places. So CTCL provided funds that were ultimately used to pay the election workers in Philadelphia to operate the polling places. And, and the city of Philadelphia had to agree to operate at least 800 polling places in, on election day uh, in, in, the, uh, in the wards um, and in the divisions in the city of Philadelphia. Um, to the extent that goals of the plan are not met, the city must communicate to the grantor the number of polling places, the rationale for opening fewer than 800, um, and the approximate average and distance between, uh, between these polling places. These are all things that we now, for the first time ever in Pennsylvania, see a private entity dictating to um, a public body such as Philadelphia County. And I will tell you that some of the other counties in Pennsylvania refused to participate in these grants because they saw this as illegal. Uh, and, and so th that is certainly uh, still up in the air as to the legality of these uh, contributions. Some people think they are, some people think they're not. Um, but certainly uh, there are a number of issues that arise out of this. Daniel, if you'll scroll down a little more on this one, um, you'll see that, um, that they're, they're obligated to use these funds pursuant to this agreement. And a little more, you'll find that in section nine, CTCL may discontinue, withhold part of, or request the return of all or a part of any unspent grant funds if it determines that any of the above conditions have not been met. This is commonly called and referred to in the Gableman Report as a clawback provision. Um, the clawback provision is the, is, the, is the sword of Damocles hanging over the heads of, of the election officials in Philadelphia because should they fail to uh, comply with uh, uh, Tiana Epps Johnson, the executive director's uh, words um, and, the, and the requirements under this contract, should they, should they re, uh, fail or refuse to do so, uh, CTCL could have, re, could have requested the return of all or part, all or part of any unspent grant funds um, uh, that it would determine that, that when any of these conditions were not met. And so um, this, this, this hung over the election officials in each of these counties. The um, uh, Daniel, if you could, I think we can show. I think we can. I think you can move on from that if you get to the um, get through that. There were satellite offices provided for and drop boxes, but if we get to the next uh, document, is a, a copy is a page out of the uh, Pennsylvania Voters Alliance case, um, which for everybody participating here, you can you can keep going. And maybe we don't have it, but I, I will tell you that the, the um, uh, Pennsylvania Voters Alliance case references the fact that, uh, and we contended that plaintiffs were injured by the CTCL's private federal election grants because they were targeted to counties and cities with progressive voter patterns. And in fact, uh, numerous studies, um, and, I, and I would also tell you that if you're interested, <clears throat> the blog called Broad and Liberty has done wonderful work um, reviewing all of this. Uh, they have uh, terrific articles that, that reference um, how, this, how this money actually played out in Pennsylvania. Um, I will tell you that in Pennsylvania, yes, that's it, thank you, Dan. Um, I will tell you that in Pennsylvania, for example, in Philadelphia, um, I've already told you that, that there was more money infused from a private source than the, than the county of Philadelphia, city of Philadelphia had uh, budgeted for the election. Uh, and I will tell you that, that uh, it amounted to over $8 in some sense per voter in Philadelphia. Um, you'll see similar results in the other collar counties as well. The issues that um, arise out of, the con out of the donation of these monies uh, and by Zuckerberg and the infusion of these monies has led to um, a substantial investigation in Wisconsin. And I mentioned that briefly previously. Um, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, for example, the infusion of these funds um, increased Green Bay, which was a which was a Democratic area and trying to get out the vote in the in the blue areas. Um, it, it increased uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin's election budget 
by 331%. Justice Gableman's report um, is highly critical of the infusion of these funds. Um, he goes so far as to suggest that the infusion of these funds in a, in a public election is um, election bribery under uh, Wisconsin law. I'm not prepared to make that statement here, but I'm just re referencing what his public report says. <clears throat> I will tell you though, and I know I'm gonna run out of time here shortly, Daniel, but I, I will tell you that the issues that arise out of this um, are likely to be the subject of um, upcoming and, and, uh, and, and, and frequent lit litigation. Um, I will tell you that uh, the litigation will include questions about whether the private funding of core governmental functions such as uh, running elections is legally permissible in Pennsylvania, and in particular under our fair and free elections clause in our Pennsylvania constitution, as well as under the 14th amendment of the United States constitution. I will also tell you that, um, uh, that, that the question uh, will arise as to whether these municipal governments have the legal authority looking at, uh, for example, in the, in the non-charter counties, uh, Dillon's rule applies. So Dillon's rule of, for the law students who are on there, take a look at Dillon's rule. Um, if you're going into municipal law, you have to know what Dillon's rule is. And so Dillon's rule is, is uh, a key to whether these counties have the power to enter into, or even the, the local governments have the powers to enter into these contracts um, to, uh, to provide uh, private funding into public elections. Um, in the charter counties like Philadelphia, uh, they try to get away from Dillon's rule. And so there will be other issues related to whether those um, actions that were taken to fund these elections were, were proper um, under the Philadelphia City Charter and in Allegheny County under the Allegheny County Charter. So um, that's sort of a summary. There's a lot to this topic. I apologize for going over my time, uh, but I appreciate again, Widener University sponsoring this forum. I'm, I'm proud to be part of, the, part of this uh, panel and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. King. And moving on to our last speaker um, is uh, Professor Yale Bromberg. Uh, Yale Bromberg is a constitutional rights attorney with 20 years of experience in community organizing, advocacy, and campaigns. She counsels and represents individuals, organizations, and unions in state and federal courts across the country. Uh, her docket includes election law, voting rights, free speech, ethics, civil rights, and labor cases and projects. She is a principal of Bromberg Law LLC and serves as chief counsel and strategic advisor for the Andrew Goodman Foundation, a national organization in over 25 states dedicated to making youth votes and voices a powerful force in democracy. She is also of counsel to New Jersey labor law firm Weissman and Mintz LLC and a lecturer at Rutgers Law School where she teaches election law and the political process. Professor Bongram's legal scholarship, uh, Youth Voting Rights and the Unfulfilled Promise of the 26th Amendment is widely cited and has been dubbed a groundbreaking study and legal and organizing call for arms. Her current work includes engagement with the Harvard Kennedy School's William Trotter Collaborative for Social Justice on a National Youth Voting Rights Project. <laughs> She additionally serves on an advisory council for American Promise, a cross-partisan organization dedicated to ending big money in our political system, and recently joined the Eggleton Institute of Politics as a visiting associate. Professor Bromberg uh, previously worked in the Washington DC headquarters of Common Cause, taught and supervised litigation in Georgetown University Law Center's Civil Rights Clinic and Voting Rights Institute, and clerked for nearly three years with the Honorable Dickinson R. Du Bois in the United States District Court for the District of New Jersey. Professor Bromberg is a regular news commentator and, and contributor on democratic issues. Please welcome Professor Bromberg. Thank you, Daniel. Good morning, everyone. Uh, a pleasure to be invited and Daniel and to all the law review um, editors. Uh, thank you for all your support and organizing I know the behind the scene, I just had a law symposium yesterday at Rutgers Law. So I know how time intensive um, and labor intensive this is to do on that back end. I, it's really a pleasure to join you all. I learned a lot from the prior speakers, not having litigated in uh, Pennsylvania directly. 
um, although following, of course, the news and the changes of laws, uh, as we all have, and supporting in Pennsylvania to some degree. I wanted to offer you a little bit more of a national lens. The topic uh, for this panel is voting rights and the 2020 election. Daniel, just before I, can you just remind me, are we, I, I thought we had an end time for 1115. I just don't want to go too, too much over. Yes, the end time is 11.15, uh, but the uh, so the next panel doesn't start till 11.30, so if you need, you know, in a couple extra minutes, that's fine. Okay, I just want to respect everyone's time. So I think that before I even kind of go into the 2020 context, if I'm, I'm looking at the folks with their videos on, I just want to do a survey. <laughs> um, has anyone here heard of the 26th Amendment? And when I say heard, I mean, do you know what it is? Like, what does it protect? I don't think I see any hands. So the 26th Amendment was ratified 50 years ago. We're celebrating the 50th year anniversary of it this year. It's the most recent voting rights related amendment to be ratified in the United States Constitution. 50 years ago, and I see a lot of hope in this amendment, especially given the hyperpolarization of our political climate right now, because what happened was the nation came together in record time uh, to lower the voting age to 18 and to outlaw um, the discrimination on account of age in terms of access to the ballot. And what's really remarkable about this amendment, um, and I'm one of a small handful of scholars um, focusing on this in the country, which is kind of remarkable because when you look at constitutional rights, you always see <laughs> a plethora of scholarship. Um, so it's very much going through a rejuvenation um, so I'm not surprised that there were no hands that were raised. And what happened 50 years ago was that across partisan lines, actually unanimously in the Senate, nearly unanimously in the US House, um, and the quickest amendment to be ratified in United States history, going through the 38 requisite states in less than 100 days, the nation came together to expand access to the ballot free of age discrimination. And why is this important? It's because, and I see some younger faces here, maybe not all, <laughs> but um, what, why this is important is because there was a, a widespread recognition um, the, across partisan lines that young people were actually, and young votes were valuable and necessary for democracy and for the practice of democracy. And there were a host of reasons for, for to support that. I don't want to spend too much time on, on this piece. I just wanted to offer kind of a top line um, constitutional overview of this expansion of the right to vote um, in 1971. And again, in 2020, we saw unprecedented voting rates in this nation's history across all age cohorts. Um, and that also tracked for youth voters specifically. Um, we saw um, it was the highest voter turnout in the 21st century with 67% of all citizens over the, over the age of 18 voting. That's 17 million more people voting in 2020 compared to the last presidential cycle, 17 million. Uh, for, for youth voters that tracks, 2020 was the first election in which the majority of voters under the age of 30 voted. Um, and there were two main reasons for this. One was, um, there was there were very clear and obvious questions about uh, democracy and the rule of law being on the ballot. Um, and also there was this, in response to COVID, uh, there was a sweep of efforts for election modernization, which we hadn't really fully embraced before. There were certain restrictions that were nonetheless um, in place. However, generally speaking, there were very positive trends for election modernization. And this translated not only for youth voters, but for voters across partisan lines. Um, such as expanded no excuse vote by mail opportunities, expanded early voting periods, expanded availability of drop boxes, and smart use of technology, such as to update voter registration information, track ballots, and in some states be notified about and be, have the opportunity to cure deficient vote by mail ballots. What's also notable about 2020, because I, I, I focus on youth voting, is that the highest states, um, that allowed for uniform mail ballots and expanded ballots tracked with the highest youth participation. So youth turnout was the highest 57% in states that mailed ballots to all registered voters. 
and the lowest in states with the most restrictive vote by mail ballots. Um, and so this also begs the question with regard to how we use uh, election modernization tools, which is, you know, you can, <laughs> and as young people, you know, you can check your phone very easily and have access to so much information. Um, and so there are, there, I think, I believe that there will be new ways in which we can continue to modernize our election systems to ensure that every valid ballot is counted. And this includes, for example, we should be receiving, um, we should get to the point where we can receive um, communications about deficient uh, ballots via text message, for example, or an opportunity to cure. Um, we should be able to know. An interesting thing is that for provisional ballots that are rejected, there's actually no proactive notification requirement by the county registrars to tell you. So if you go and you vote provisionally, you just assume it kind of goes into the ether um, unless you proactively go and check uh, what happened with your provisional ballot. But, you know, we have, this is a fundamental right. So in sum, the 2020 presidential election was a watershed moment for our democracy as a record number of Americans and particularly young Americans turned out to vote. And this was despite a global pandemic and economic crisis. Um, and we saw historic rates. And another interesting statistic is that 70% of young people reported voting early or absentee during the presidential election. The, re the reaction to that is that states introduced, started to introduce the greatest reduction in voter access since the late 19th century. Um, more than 250 voter suppression bills in 43 states had been carried over, pre-filed or introduced in 2021, uh, immediately after the um, 2020 race. That is, for context, that's seven times higher the number of similar bills that the same time the, pri the previous year. So in, in response to this expanded access and democratic participation and uh, availing ourselves of common sense election modernization tools, we started to see a push towards restrictions. These proposals look to limit uh, mail ballot access, impose stricter voter identification requirements, uh, and, and enable more aggressive voter purges. And of course, uh, there also, there's this, this, this um, premise that they're being, that these bills are being introduced based on the notion that the election, the 2020 election was stolen. Um, that premise was debunked more than 100 times by courts. Um, and it really creates a false dichotomy, which is that we have to choose between access to the ballot and election integrity which is simply not the case. Um, the various courts, the over 100 courts that, that examined this issue, or over 100 times that the courts examined this issue, they didn't find um, significant amounts of voter fraud, um, and certainly not with regard to the ability to overturn the election results. Um, and also the numerous government agencies affirmed, for example, one, which was actually, it's the, a joint statement by the Elections Infrastructure Government Coordinating Com Council and the Sector for Coordinating Council Executive Committees. These are high level federal agencies that basically work together. They issued a joint statement that found that the November 3rd election was the most secure, I'm quoting, in American history. There is no evidence that any voting system deleted or lost votes, changed votes, or was in any way compromised. Um, so where are we? <laughs> um, we, I think that we have a lot to learn from the 2020 election in terms of what election modernization offers us, both for election integrity and for our democratic participation. And I can speak a little more about the specific um, limitations in terms of access to the ballot for youth voters and the way that that appears. Um, pursuant to the 26th Amendment or state constitutional law. Um, but, you know, we can, we can also get into that with the question and answer. But one of some of the areas that I really see uh, trends with regard to youth voter um, confusion and disenfranchisement um, is, there are a few. One, for example, is that it's not uniform that the most common, the most available form of identification that students have, which is a student um, identification can be used as a form of voter identification at the polls. 
um, that's a very obvious, you know, in Wisconsin, even in Wisconsin, for example, um, where they do allow for student identification, in order for that student ID to serve as a valid form of voter identification, it can only be two years old. Um, and as students, you know that you don't go to school for two years. Um, so the, the student identification is um, serves every other purpose. It doesn't expire for any other purpose other than the, the ability for it to sound, uh, be treated as a valid form of voter identification. That impacts 300,000 students across the state of Wisconsin alone. Um, there are several states that do not allow students to vote using their student identification cards. There are states which allow for you to vote with a handgun license and not your student identification card. Tennessee allows for faculty members to vote with their um, with the, the, the faculty identification card issued by an institution of higher education, but does not allow for the students from the same institutions of higher education to vote with their student identification cards, although they go through the same process. Um, there's also other areas that actually don't necessarily impinge on, on state legislative action, although there can be proactive state bills and there are uh, very, there are a few model examples of that. But even on the local level, um, I did a study of, I did a study, a quantitative analysis of um, the availability of polling locations on college campuses. The history of the 26th Amendment, the, the Senate report actually bears out it, acknowledges what's called as special burdens for young people to be able to participate in the ballot. And it sees that it informs that the 26th Amendment must be interpreted as a salve to alleviate special burdens and says that this, this is the Senate report that accompanied the bill that went to the proposal that rounded through the states and through Congress. Um, it, it actually identifies a few specific examples um, as a non-exhaustive non examples. One is students having to go uh, far off campus in order to vote. And the other one is them having to rely on vote by mail in order to vote. And the, the latter was really a response to elections being scheduled uh, when students are not in semester. There were some examples that they were being purposely scheduled for that time period. And the other is, is the, the on-campus piece. So I did, an, I did a quantitative analysis of the availability of on-campus polling locations in, um, I believe that I looked at, I have to pull it up. Um, I believe that it was 59 campuses across 24 states and the District of Columbia. And what I found was that on election day uh, in 2018, guys, I was looking at the, I was doing a retrospective for 2018, 2020 was a, too much of a fluke for analyzing this piece of it. Um, in 2018, only 50% of the campuses surveyed offered an on-campus polling location on election day. And where early voting was available through state law, even less, 40% allowed for the remedy um, uh, pursuant for, uh, for the early period. And I guess the last piece that I'll mention is this with regard to the 26th Amendment. We litigated a case in Florida, um, which established a, a new precedent on the 26th Amendment in 2018 on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Florida and the Andrew Goodman Foundation. And there the Secretary of State implemented an outright ban on the availability of um, polling places on campuses during the early voting period. We got that ban lifted based on the 26th Amendment. And what's more is um, that after the removal, you know, the overture of this ban, um, there were essentially three months left. The judge, the judge imposed a preliminary injunction, August 2018. November 2018 was the general election. In three months, uh, 12 campuses and county registrars worked together to bring polling places on campuses. And then we quantified the impact of that and 60,000 voters availed themselves of this remedy. Um, I think on the last note that I'll, the last point, because I think it's very important with regard to the hyperpolarization of our political system that we have today and the hyperpolarization of um, these basic concepts with regard to voter access and the way in which voter access is pitted against the um, notion of election integrity. 
is that is the 26th amendment is that the nation came together across partisan lines nearly unanimously to support access to the ballot for young people and the reason they did that is the same reason that um you know what's really what's really promising i believe with the youth vote and when we when we study election mechanisms that target or impact the youth vote is that this impacts voters across partisan lines what i found is that republican parents they don't want their children to, to be denied access to the ballot, that Republican youth can recognize when their ballot, access to the ballot is being challenged. And this lens of studying um, these infringements with regard to the 26th Amendment offers an opportunity to provide a framework. Because as you know, you were recently college students and now you're law students. When you move every year, you have to overcome certain obstacles, information obstacles, where is your polling location, um, how do you update your voter registration materials, et cetera, every single year. Um, and, and this is something that impacts across partisan lines. You can appreciate the, the ways in which this directly impacts you, um, but, the, but the 26th Amendment itself allows us to remove this um, argument that's often put on youth voters um, or just young people in general, which is to blame them, <laughs> to say you're apathetic, you're not engaged, you messed this up, um, you were confused about this uh, aspect of, uh, you know, uh, election law, when this is the first time that you're, you're, you're availing yourself of access to the ballot and trying to create a new habit and learn something new, which is always challenging for new voters. And the 26th Amendment provides an opportunity to understand and appreciate the ways in which um, developmental science shows that voting is habit forming. And if it is true, um, as was recognized across partisan lines, um, you know, Commander in Chief Eisenhower included this in his 1954 State of the Union, and President Nixon signed it into law, and Barry Goldwater held it up. So this was something that was really, it was a measure that was actually. Um, um, really championed through middle America, through Appalachia, but the farmers were supporting it. This was not something that um, was a form of a liberal agenda. And my, my, the hope that I have when we study youth voting rights specifically is that we can get out of this hyper-polarized uh, piece because youth is something we all, God willing, uh, experience, right? We all experience being young at one point and we all age up out of the class. So it's something that we can all, it's a common um, experience that we all can sympathize and understand. And in that way, we get out of this divisiveness. And then of course, is the, the notion that the young voters are the ones that are inheriting the decisions, the outcomes of the decisions that legislators are making today. And we can look at how that's translated and how their political voice translates um, within the state and federal legislatures, including with regard to uh, the presence of um, candidates and issues that represent youth voters specifically. I think I'll end it there. I just want to be sensitive for time. So thank you. I really learned a lot from the prior um, speakers and thank you for the opportunity to meet with you. Thank you, Professor Bromberg. Uh, yes, unfortunately we are out of time so we won't have enough time for questions, um, but I just wanted to thank all of the speakers um, for what I sure everyone will agree is a fascinating uh, panel. Um, again, yes, thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting the Widener Law Review. Um, we're going to take about a five minute break and then uh, we will start our last panel. Hello everyone, it is 11.30, so we're gonna get started again. Um, welcome back. If you're just joining us, thank you for coming to the annual Widener Law Review Symposium. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce one of our professors who will be moderating this session, uh, Professor Randy Lee. Thank you very much, Daniel, both for the introduction and also for all your work on the program. Um, I must admit, as I was going through the bios of the speakers on this panel, um, I was pretty much in awe. So I'm just gonna get right to it. Uh, and I will introduce them one at a time. I will introduce them and then have them speak and then introduce the, the next speaker if that, that works for you, Daniel. 
Um, so our first speaker is Professor, Professor Chara Torres Spellacy, who teaches constitutional law at Stetson University College of Law. She is, however, currently a visiting professor of law at the Washington College of Law at American University. In her work, Professor Torres Spellacy focuses on the intersection of campaign finance law and corporate law. Professor Torres Spellacy has written 20 law review articles. She has also written hundreds of short essays, articles, and blogs about law and elections in the popular press, including pieces for the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the Atlantic. In addition, Professor Torres Spellacy has written two books, Corporate Citizen, published in 2016, and Political Brands, published in 2019, and is currently working on her third book. Professor Torres Spellacy has testified as an expert on campaign finance reform before Congress, as well as before state and local legislative bodies, and she has been featured in documentaries and in a Netflix special on money and politics. Among her many awards and honors, Stetson University College of Law has awarded Professor Torres Spellacy both the Dickerson Brown Award for Excellence in Faculty Scholarship and the Homer and Dolly Hand Award for Excellence in Faculty Research. Professor Torres Spellacy. Thank you uh, for that generous introduction. So I am going to try to share my PowerPoint. <clears throat> Can you see my PowerPoint? Let's start with that. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> you never know. All right. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is where money and politics intersects with voting rights. Um, I am uh, at American visiting, flying up and down the East Coast, uh, but my home is at Stetson. So I am talking to you from Florida, the other swing state. So right now I'm writing my third book on corporate money and politics. And two things strike me. One, that money and politics has always been broader than what's captured in our campaign finance system. Uh, and secondarily, that election lawyers and election professors have a real blind spot for criminality. And I think there's a really good explanation for this. Uh, the way that law is taught is incredibly siloed. I teach election law. I don't teach white collar crime. Uh, and usually the true is vice versa. The criminal law professors rarely teach election law. And also election law professors are often put in the position where we have to be cheerleaders for democracy, which is not the worst thing to do, but I think it, it adds to this blind spot of um, not expecting people to uh, be criminals in the middle of an election. And one of the things that also sort of strikes me is that the trouble with the big lie in the 2020 election is that it makes people wrongly think that there was something wrong in the presidential election, but it also hides that there were some real problems uh, during that election. So if you buy the uh, trope that money is speech, uh, as a majority of our Supreme Court justices do, as a matter of uh, First Amendment jurisprudence, then you will have a particularly rosy view of the role of money in politics. Uh, and I think it looks a little bit like this. Uh, if money is speech, then more speech is good. Uh, the more money you have in an election, the more uh, that there will be communication with voters, information for them, whether that is in live rallies or through millions of dollars of TV ads, and then that ends in a free and fair election where this informed electorate has uh, learned uh, about candidates uh, through the expenditure of money. I'm not sure why my things are clicking around. Sorry about that. Okay, so that mythology I think is only matched by you know love of uh, apple pie, mom, and the flag, and. I'm going to talk to about some of the darker sides of what happened in the 2020 election. 
basically for years and years and years during election season, I end up talking to many reporters, especially here in Florida. And so for years, I heard questions from newspaper men uh, basically asking me about either hobby candidates or fake candidates. And I wasn't quite sure what they were getting at. But my classic response, um, at least eight years running, was something like this, um, that new candidates are great. And I think that shows my bias as an election lawyer, as a cheerleader for elections. I didn't think that anything pernicious could be going on. Uh, but in retrospect, I think what these journalists were trying to ask me about was an ongoing criminal conspiracy, which I will explain in a moment. And I'm a little um, angry at myself for not seeing this because I do write about money and politics and money and politics can back into white collar crime, including most famously in Watergate, uh, which I've written about extensively. And I think the lesson from Watergate is if you wanna know what's happening in American politics, you need to follow the money. Uh, and when you do that in the Watergate context, uh, you find an enormous amount of illegal corporate money was flowing through the committee to reelect the president in 1972, which has the awesome acronym CREEP. And all of this illegal corporate money in CREEP was used for other illegal activities, uh, including these famous burglaries. One is uh, Dr. Fielding's uh, office. He was uh, Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist. And then, of course, the break-in at the DNC office in 72 uh, at the Watergate building. So let's turn to a more modern example, the 2020 election. Uh, in uh, the 2020 election here in Florida, uh, Democratic voters got lots of mailers that look like this. And the reason why Democratic voters got lots of mailers that looked like this is that someone was spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to send these mailers to Democratic voters. And as you can see, they look sort of eerily similar. They use the same stock footage. And it's a little bit ambiguous whether the Black woman who is pictured here is supposed to be the candidate or is supposed to be a constituent. But nonetheless, uh, this was just an actress. This was just a stock uh, image. Uh, she was not running for any office in Florida. And now what we know is that these mailers were part of what uh, the press in Florida has now dubbed the ghost candidate problem. And so the real Justine is the white woman who uh, is um, on my right. Uh, it is not the black woman at all. Uh, and Justine ran as a non-party affiliated candidate in uh, Florida, in a Florida Senate race. Uh, and she wasn't alone. Uh, there were a number of these non-affiliated candidates who ran for Florida Senate. And in most of them, it looks like it was not outcome determinative, but in District 37, it arguably was. Uh, and in District 37, you also have a sound alike candidate. So both the incumbent and this ghost candidate have the last name Rodriguez. And the ghost candidate gets more votes than the incumbent loses by. So this was an election that came down to 32 votes. Uh, and Arguably that ghost candidate played the role of spoiler. So um, since I'm a campaign finance person, let's follow the money in Florida. So the reason why this will probably end up in my book and why I think this is a corporate uh, scandal as well is reporters are tracing the money that went to these hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of misleading mailers to a company called Florida Power and Light. Um, it's uh, a large utility here in Florida. And if you look at their on the record spending, it's not that outrageous for a, a company their size, um, you know, about 23 million over um, 24 years. 
And if you specifically look at the on record spending from Florida Power and Light in the 2020 election in Florida, it looks tiny. Uh, they are giving thousand dollar donations to particular candidates. Um, and, you know, which is perfectly legal under Florida law. Uh, but I think we get a very different picture if we look at a document like this. So this has been produced by a whistleblower. Uh, and what it shows is Florida Power and Light being billed by a Alabama uh, LLC called Matrix. And they're being billed for over a million dollars for uh, consulting and research during the 2020 election. And so what the press has put together is allegedly uh, that Florida Power and Light gave millions of dollars to this Alabama LLC matrix that then gave millions of dollars to an entity called Grow United, which also changed its name during this election. It used to be known as Proclivity. And that entity in turn gave money to at least two PACs, one called Our Florida and another sort of Orwellianly named the Truth Pack. And then those PACs uh, bought the uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of mailers, which are then micro-targeted at uh, Democratic voters in Florida. Uh, and one of the reasons why I care about an entity about Florida Power and like Florida, Florida Power and Light is not only is it a big entity in its own, uh, it is also a subsidiary of an even bigger entity called Next Era Energy. And Next Era Energy is um, a publicly traded corporation. Now, if you look at uh, Next Era energies on the record spending. It also doesn't seem particularly big for an entity its size. Uh, but I worry about entities like Next Era spending in our elections because, you know, depending on the market price that day, they have uh, a market cap of over a hundred billion dollars. And it's, I think it's one of the things that we've had to deal with post Citizens United what does it mean to share a democracy with an entity that has that many resources? So back to District 37. This is the one with the sound alike ghost candidate that comes down to 32 votes. Uh, there have actually been prosecutions over this election. Uh, so the real Alex Rodriguez is the man you see before you, not the black woman uh, in the mailer. And uh, the real Alex Rodriguez uh, was uh, charged for violating Florida campaign finance laws. So allegedly what happened here is that a ex-senator named Frank Artillis uh, bribed Mr. Rodriguez to run as a ghost candidate. And so Artillis is charged with breaking the uh, campaign finance laws by giving him too much money. And Alex Rodriguez was charged with accepting too much money. Uh, and uh, at the end of last year, Alex Rodriguez actually pled guilty to this and he has now turned state's evidence. And so one of the things that I am looking forward to is later this year, there will be a criminal trial for Senator Artillas. And I really hope that this goes to trial. And the reason I hope it goes to trial and he doesn't just plea is uh, I hope that it might illuminate this money trail and tell us more in the public, especially the voting public here in Florida, who paid for this and who knew what when uh, in terms of this money going into this scheme. So, um, you know, that happy narrative from before that more money in politics can only be to the better because that means more communication with voters uh, and, a, you know, a better informed electorate. I think this really turns that on its head. Um, instead, what we see is, uh, you know, a polluting industry using dark money to fund a fake set of fake candidates one of whom has already pled guilty to this being part of a criminal conspiracy. 
And that is, a, I think, a much darker picture of how money and politics can interact with our right to vote in an informed way. So thank you. Thank you, Chara, for that um, wonderful talk. And now we will move on to uh, Professor Samuel Weissman, who is a professor at Penn State Law University Park, where Professor Weissman teaches and writes in the areas of criminal procedure, criminal law, and constitutional law. Professor Weissman has published numerous articles on, in various law journals, including the, the Yale Law Journal, Minnesota Law Review, Iowa Law Review, George Washington Law Review, and the Boston College Law Review. In addition, Professor Weissman has also recently spoken at programs at Northwestern, Vanderbilt, the University of North Carolina, and UCLA Law Schools. Prior to teaching at Penn State, Professor Weissman taught at the law schools of the University of Tulsa and Florida State. Prior to teaching, Professor Weissman served as a law clerk to Judge Fortunato Benavidez um, of the U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals and Chief Justice Wallace Jefferson of the Supreme Court of Texas. Professor Weissman received a BA summa cum laude from Yale University and a JD from Yale Law School. Professor Weissman. Thank you very much for that <clears throat> introduction. And thanks to the law review, the law school and to Daniel uh, for having me here, for putting this together. I've learned a lot already this morning uh, and it's been a pleasure. So I'm gonna to try to share my screen. Is that working? Yeah, you'd think after two years of Zoom, I'd be good at this. Uh, I am not. So apologies in advance. So I, uh, you know, my background is primarily uh, in criminal law and, and procedure, but, uh, and, I, and I certainly would echo Professor uh, Torres Spellacy's um, remark that law teaching and scholarship tends to be very siloed. Um, but like a lot of people, I think in the last few years, uh, um, I've, you know, the, the salience of, uh, of election law has, has um, drawn me in. And so I wanna talk a little bit today about uh, election fraud and its, and its penalties. And I'm going to look at it being a criminal law person, primarily through a criminal law lens uh, before coming back a little bit and taking uh, a broader view. Right. So the problem uh, as, I, as I see it is that in many cases, the existing state and federal penalties for different types of, uh, of election fraud, voter fraud, fail to adequately reflect the uh, differing uh, severity uh, of different types of, uh, of voting violations and their potential impact uh, on elections. So I'm gonna start off uh, by giving just a few examples. So some of you may be familiar with some of these cases. Right? Uh, so Crystal Mason, Texas voter, 2017. She's a convicted felon on supervised release and then voted in the 2016 election. Uh, she failed to read the affidavit she signed casting a provisional ballot, which was uh, which stated that she had, that if she was a felon, she had completed all punishment. She was still on supervised release. Her provisional uh, vote was not ultimately counted, uh, but nonetheless, she was prosecuted, uh, convicted of what at the time was a second degree uh, felony and sentenced to a five year prison term. Also in Texas in 2016, Rosa Maria Ortega, so lawful permanent resident, uh, who came to the United States as a, uh, as a baby and received a green card as a child. She voted in, in multiple elections. According to her lawyer, uh, she simply didn't know that she wasn't entitled uh, to vote. 
She was convicted of two counts uh, uh, of illegal voting, sentenced uh, to an eight-year prison term, and faces deportation after parole. I'm going to contrast those examples uh, with, uh, with a, a, a couple other examples here. So we have a Florida election worker uh, who altered at least two mail-in ballots. So working uh, in the election uh, office and actively changing votes. Right? So at least two, probably more. Right? Ultimately gets sentenced to two years of house arrest. At another elections official in Oregon in 2013, right, again, filling in uh, ballots uh, that have been submitted by others, right? pleads guilty, gets 90 days in jail. Right? Finally, Kimberly Redis, an election committee member, stealing a ballot box. One count corrupt conduct by an election official one count of intimidating voters, $950 fine, 30 days of jail time suspended, probation. Right? And so what, I, what these examples are intended to show is that there, there is, at least in these cases, a disconnect between the, what I would say the, uh, is the severity of the offense and the punishment faced by the offender. On the one hand, uh, an individual legal vote, extremely unlikely to affect outcomes, but stealing ballot boxes, marking other people's ballots, uh, those things might. And, and this, although you know, I've certainly carefully chosen my examples, uh, these, uh, these problems don't exist solely uh, in individual cases, Naturally, they're reflected in the underlying laws. And so, for example, from, uh, from federal law, we see that the punishment for uh, both materially false tabulation of ballots, which potentially, of course, you can easily see it have the potential to swing an election versus submitting any false information material to an individual registration carry the same penalty. And, and I'm, not going, uh, uh, I'm not going to uh, read through all the examples uh, on these slides, um, but we, we can see here right, some uh, additional uh, examples uh, in, in federal law, varying degrees, separating out um, uh, what I would call more serious offenses from less serious offenses. In the states, right, we see much of this as well um, from my, my research. So, for example, just briefly, in Alabama, unlawful voting, uh, same penalty, tampering with voting machines. In, uh, in Michigan, a maximum penalty of one additional year for willfully destroying uh, ballot box or statements of votes and voting when unqualified, it goes compared to voting when unqualified. Again, I'll try not to belabor the point too much. Uh, I know we have another speaker to get to. Uh, so let me try to explain why I think this is a problem. So on the one hand, from a criminal law perspective, significant jail or prison time for individual voter fraud, voting twice, registering to vote illegally, is probably unnecessary. There's no evidence of widespread individual voting fraud, and there's good reason to think that there wouldn't be. Even in an election with as high as stakes as the 2020 presidential election, something like two thirds of eligible voters voted. Why? Well, in part because 
rationally, each individual vote is extremely unlikely to affect outcomes. So if I certainly voted, but if I hadn't, things would have turned out just the way they did. And so facing any kind of, uh, of, of criminal penalty for uh, an, a single additional vote makes it quite unlikely that any rational actor would do so. And to be fair, the actual sentence, sentences imposed in typical uh, individual voter fraud cases appear to reflect this. Right? So an example from New Hampshire, but facing a, where the uh, duplicate voting, $4,000 fine, but a suspended sentence. Right? Similar example from Colorado, voting twice, $500 fine. So what's the problem then? If, at least in most cases, individual voting fraud, although it could be punished uh, by uh, fairly significant jail terms, is often punished less harshly. Well, one thing, there's certainly the potential for individual, in, uh, individual injustice. Right? So, there's no guarantee that any particular judge in any particular case will sentence uh, um, uh, someone who's voted twice, say, uh, um, less severely than someone who's destroyed a ballot box. But it also uh, opens uh, the door to racial and partisan disparities. So you'll remember my examples of, uh, of um, Ms. Ortega and Ms. Mason. The same district attorney's office that prosecuted those cases also prosecuted a, uh, a white justice of the peace who had forged signatures to get uh, on the ballot and accepted a plea deal for five months probation. Now, of course, I'm, I'm not privy to what went on in the decision-making in that office, but it certainly looks bad Right. And as you can, I won't read out the Houston Chronicles editorial to you, but as you can see here, the perception certainly in Texas was that uh, the decision making was racially motivated. And that it, even the perception, of course, and certainly the reality of racially motiv motivated uh, prosecutions, particularly in the context of election law, is extremely harmful to our democracy. In addition, the threat, the threat of, uh, of prison time for voting when, uh, as some of our speakers today uh, have highlighted, it can be difficult to, find, to figure out whether or not you're properly registered, uh, whether you're registered in the appropriate area, whether you're entitled to vote in a uh, in a place you've moved to recently, or if you're a student, raising uh, the, the, uh, the possibility then uh, of significant uh, uh, criminal penalties can be used to, uh, to intimidate voters, as you can see in these billboards um, from 2012. Right. Now, so far, I've been, been talking about the dangers of punishing individual voter fraud too much. But I think there's also a danger, potentially, of punishing more serious types of election fraud too little. So things, in my view, that might that have a more realistic chance of materi materially affecting election outcomes should carry higher penalties. As it is now, prosecutors often have to rely on additional statutes from outside the election context. So in this example uh, here from Philadelphia, federal prosecutors relied on the Travel Act because the 
to reach a maximum penalty of 15 years because of the relative weakness of, uh, of the directly applicable voting laws. So the solution then, and I believe is relatively few, if you're on board so far, right, the solution is relatively straightforward. Reduce the penalties for individual legal voting and raise them for fraud that is more likely to materially affect election outcomes. This is, and although it might seem like I've been picking on Texas, which is my home state, uh, I want to end by suggesting that they've, uh, they might, in, in this case, uh, be in the forefront of taking some steps, at least, in, in this direction. So in, uh, in a reaction to the Crystal Mason case, they've downgraded the, uh, the, the offense of, uh, of illegal voting to a misdemeanor which uh, I think certainly is a step in the right direction. So thank you all uh, again uh, for having me and I look forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Weissman. Our final speaker is someone familiar to all of us. Uh, Christian Johnson served as the inaugural Dean for Widener University Commonwealth Law School and currently directs Widener Commonwealth's business advising program. Prior to joining Widener, Dean Johnson was the Hugh B. Brown Presidential Endowed Chair of Law and the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the University of Utah College of Law. Dean Johnson is a frequent commentator and academic focusing primarily on global capital markets. Dean Johnson has co-authored five books and written over three dozen auth articles. Dean Johnson speaks frequently on legal issues involving capital markets and is presented for US banking and financial regulators, as well as central banks and academic institutions and financial institutions in Europe, Asia, Africa, the Middle East, North and South America, and Australia. Over the past year, Dean Johnson has spoken at conferences in Madrid, Stockholm, and the University of Arkansas. Dean Johnson has also testified before the United States Congress. Among his many public service activities, Dean Johnson serves as finance committee member of the United States Army Heritage Center Foundation, as a board member of MidPen Legal Services, and as the co-chair of the Virtual Currency and Financial Technology Subcommittee, New York City Committee on Futures and Derivatives Regulation. Dean Johnson received his JD from Columbia Law School where he was executive editor of the Columbia Law Review and a Stone Scholar. Dean Johnson. Professor Lee, thank you very much. It's uh, with some trepidation that I take the very last uh, speaking position, keeping all of you from lunch. But uh, fortunately, this is really interesting, the topic that we're, uh, we're going to talk about today. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Make sure we have a... Uh, Good screen. Okay, Dan, have we got a good share there? Yes, Professor. Terrific. Okay, great. Um, let me. Uh, so, what what I'm going to talk about is the current quite divided approach that different states take to allowing individuals that have committed a felony uh, to vote. And it, it's, uh, it's really surprising and really caught my attention. And uh, I've got some future research in this area that I'm, uh, I'm going to be working on, but it's really a big problem. Uh, when you look at what's going on, um, the, the Sentencing Project, which is a, kind of a think tank in, uh, in DC has done some really good work on the area. It turns out that 5.2 million Americans are unable to vote because they had uh, committed a felony. Turns out that approximately 2.7% of the US population cannot vote uh, because of a prior felony con conviction. And then when you start looking on a state-by-state -state basis, 8% of the population in Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee cannot vote because of problems. 
And uh, disturbingly, 6.2% of the African-American population has, uh, has issues voting because of, uh, of previous felony convictions. And it's, uh, as you look at the uh, sort of the likelihood of who ends up being imprisoned because of, of felony issues, you can see that there's, uh, there's big concerns, uh, both um, by the number and in particular by the, uh, the demographic makeup or eth ethnicity of those most likely to be in prison and then most likely to be unable to vote uh, once they, uh, they come out of it. Now, what's really interesting about this is that the US, the, uh, US Supreme Court has come out unequivocally that there is no right to vote for an individual that has been convicted of a felony and that they are not protected by the Equal Protection Clause. And why that's so interesting is essentially the Supreme Court has decided that they need to read Clause 1 of the Equal Protection Clause and Clause 2 of the Equal Protection Clause uh, consistently, which makes sense, sort of, as you look at what goes on. You look at the, uh, the Equal Protection Clause, which provides enormous protection against states disenfranchising uh, uh, different demographic groups. Um, no state shall deny to any person equal protection of the laws. And it would seem to be uh, states targeting a particular group of individuals that have, have paid their price and, and done their time and become rehabilitated. It's interesting that uh, the states still have that power to deprive them of the, the right to vote. Until you, you look at the second clause of the, equal, the 14th Amendment, which Oddly enough, really doesn't have anything to do with the first clause, but the idea is that the Supreme Court is trying to read the 14th Amendment consistently. And when we're dealing with the apportionment uh, for purposes of, of elections, in other words, counting how many people are in a particular area for, with respect to apportioning representation, um, the state is, is not allowed to take into account for apportionment any person who has been deprived the right to vote, except if they were involved in participation in rebellion, uh, civil war, for example, or kind of this is the key language, uh, other crimes. And that's been interpreted by the Supreme Court basically to, to mean felonies. And so the idea being is that, well, if you, for purposes of import, apportionment, you can, exclude individuals that have committed a crime, but still not let them vote, then equal protection doesn't necessarily apply then to those that have committed an other crime. And so they've, they've come out very directly and, and it's been um, upheld or, or followed by, by numerous circuits and, and other courts. That, uh, that equal protection doesn't protect this particular group of individuals who have committed a felony in the past, but has uh, paid their price and, uh, and is out of prison now. So this is kind of, this is very, uh, this, this Judge Henry Friendly quote is, is very kind of uh, representative of the idea that there's, there's, there's no irrationality to, to depriving these individuals of the right to vote. It says it can scarcely be deemed unreasonable for a state to decide that perpetrators of serious crimes shall not take part in electing the legislatures who make the laws. In other words, if you're convicted of a crime, then you're going to go and try and vote them out because you don't like the fact that they're imposing these kinds of crimes. Uh, the executives who enforce the laws, uh, the prosecutors, so we all know bad guys don't like prosecutors. So of course they would not want to vote for them or they would try and vote them out or judges who are to consider their cases. And so they, there's just been this notion that, it's, that it seems perfectly reasonable to, to come to the conclusion that these that individuals who have been convicted of a felony therefore should, uh, should not be able to vote. And so when you look at the, again, this is a question of state law and uh, this is kind of a nifty chart and I've, 
I've highlighted what are considered to be red versus blue states. And so it's, it's really interesting to kind of look at what happens with this. Uh, in nine states, if you commit a felony, uh, you may lose your vote permanently. Okay, and you can see they're mostly red states, not that the, 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 for the analysis, this is very simplistic, but, it, but it's kind of interesting in trying to get your arms around what's going on here. Um, and then there are 16 states that say you don't get to vote until you're out of prison, you finish your parole, parole and any probation, which could probably take a long time. Um, 16 states there. So basically half the states are requiring individuals who've been convicted of a felony to have served their time, gone through par parole and any probation uh, standpoint. Um, some states only uh, re will restore the right after you've completed parole. Um, 21 states say, well, after you've paid your time, done your time, uh, you can vote. Uh, and there's 21 states there. And then um, three bold jurisdictions, DC, Maine, and Vermont say, uh, even if you're incarcerated, you still get to vote. So, so it's kind of interesting to look at what a broad uh, array. And again, it's almost 50-50, again, basically uh, kind of reinforcing where we are in our country with how people view uh, issues like this. Again, sort of. It's a little more complicated than that as we uh, as we move through this. And really, what it comes down to is, I've studied the issue and and and, and read the literature. Is there sort of this philosophical conflict or debate about the importance of voting? And so you tend to either believe voting is so fundamental that it should be a constitutional right, and if it's not, it's natural law, and you should still be able to vote. Absolutely critical. And then you have this other side that says, writing to vote is a privilege. And if you do something bad, um, we're gonna take that vote away from you. And so you've got this fundamental right versus privilege weighing. It's, it's kind of the way that I see the, uh, the debates and discussions going about dealing with uh, this particular issue. Uh, you know, a, a lot of individuals, uh, and, and again, I don't have a dog, you know, it's the dog in this fight, I mean, for want of a better expression. Um, in a democracy, the idea is that everyone has a right to vote and that it's really dangerous to start denying the right to vote to anybody. And it's a fundamental right, it's not a privilege, and we should be allowing them. And, and perhaps just as importantly, uh, the issue is that um, it's an important part of rehabilitation, that when you come out of prison having, having committed a felony and you've paid your time, done your dues, whatever the expression, um, the right to vote is it's it's part of returning as a fully participating citizen. Um, you you undermine their right their respect for the law if you don't let them vote. If they have the right to vote, it strengthens their social ties to society. All of these kinds of vote all these kinds of issues get raised as to why we should allow these individuals to to vote when they get out. And then you kind of come to the uh, the uh, the other side where you have this uh, sort of, excuse me, um, you have this other side where the, this, the, the question is, this is a privilege, so why should we allow these people to vote that have done all these terrible things? And that kind of ties into Judge Friendly's uh, quote that I read earlier. And again, it's kind of nasty when you have this parade of horribles. And so the idea is, do we really want murderers, rapists, sex offenders, tax evaders, the Boston Marathon bombers, uh, murderers who took the life of someone else who would want to vote but now can't because they've been killed? Do we really want them to vote? That, that's really kind of a, a, it's a very simplistic argument, but it's one that seems to resonate with a lot of individuals that, that basically by, by the actions that they've done, they've they've lost that privilege and that they should no longer be able to, uh, to participate in society's, well, society's most important functions of, uh, of voting. So what's really interesting and, and that's, that's completely untested as near as I can tell when you're looking at what's going on is one question is, is do the individuals who are convicted of felonies, would, would they vote blue or or are they all Democrats? I mean, that's kind of a simplistic statement, but I mean, that's sort of a, that's what we sort of assumes is that all of these uh, these individuals that have been convicted of a felony that they they'll vote Democratic, that they'll vote to be weak on crime, 
They'll vote to uh, change the incarceration or prison model. And what's kind of an interesting argument is a lot of the individuals that have been convicted of felonies are incarcerated in rural red counties. And so the idea is that, you know, maybe they were in Philadelphia, but now they're up in Columbia County. And do we really want them voting from prison on Columbia County issues? You know, that, that sounds, that doesn't sound right. And so these are very simplistic assumptions, I think, that people are making and assuming, but, but really tie into how they vote and what they think about these, uh, these kinds of issues. And we really have a lot of unanswered empirical questions about this. You know, what, I, you know, personally, I'm always surprised when, you know, I'll read a survey and discover that the way I think isn't the way that everybody else thinks. It's, a, it's kind of interesting. So, so some questions that really haven't been answered properly, I think, is, and, and th this, is, this, is, this is a hard question to kind of bring up, is do individuals that, that were convicted of a felony and have come out of prison, do they actually vote or do they want to vote? And the other question is, is how do they vote? You know, do they actually vote in these terrible ways that people think that they're going to vote because they, they've been convicted or are bad people? I mean, whatever the, uh, the thought would be, uh, do they favor one particular political party? I mean, I think there's enormous assumptions that um, a lot of these individuals might be coming out of large urban areas that might typically be... Uh, the bastions of the Democratic Party, et cetera, I, we don't know. And, and, and does it matter? You know, that's kind of the, what we're really struggling with is we're, we're working on these, uh, these kinds of situations. And, uh, and finally, so, so where do we go from here? You know, what do we do? Um, I think the biggest thing that, that has to be done is, is we, we've got to rethink the S Supreme Court's equal protection analysis. Um, Granted, the, the 14th Amendment has to be read consistently, but, but Clause 1 and Clause 2 conceptually really don't have much to do with each other, yet we're allowing Clause 2 to influence whether we're going to apply equal protection to, to protect individuals that have been convicted of a crime but have then uh, you know, done their time and paid their, their dues to society. And so I think that's something... Uh, uh, it's a big deal overturning Supreme Court precedent, but it's something that, uh, that, that perhaps there could be a test case or something that would uh, maybe uh, challenge the particular thinking. And then there's, you know, there's basically 26 states, 25 states that don't allow voting until after they've, they've gotten out of prison, completed probation and, and parole. Is there something that can be done in those, uh, in those particular states? Big problem is there's no lobby that uh, that's funded by individuals that have just gotten out of out of prison. So there, there's not a natural group out there that really wants to uh, to support these trends and uh, and and individuals that are concerned about ensuring that people get these votes are are oftentimes worried about being labeled as being soft on crime and and being soft on uh, individuals that have, that have done these kinds of things. And so it's, it's, a, it's a tricky political question as we're doing that. And, and then finally, you know, can we really empirically test uh, these assumptions? Because if, if the real basis is that these, uh, these individuals are, are going to vote improperly and are not gonna vote in the best interest of society, if, is that true or not true? I, I tend to think it's not true. I think they'll, the, they'll vote rationally and vote for the best interests of their communities. But is that something that, that can't be tested or, uh, or studied? Probably not, uh, but, but still kind of an interesting issue to, uh, to think about. So thank you very much. I, um, I know uh, you're anxious to, to get to lunch, but it's been, uh, it's, it's, it's been a terrific opportunity. So I'll turn the time back to, to Randy. Before we throw it open to questions, and Daniel, I'm not sure how you want to handle questions from the um, audience. Are those gonna appear in the chat or? Yeah, they can either uh, throw it in the chat or uh, use the raise hand function, whichever uh, one people feel comfortable with. Okay, um, two quick comments that I had before we, we open things up. Um, the first is I, I for sure want to thank the speakers for your 
um, tenacious respect for time constraints. There's no sicker feeling that I have as a moderator than than listening to one of my guests or former bosses go on and on past the time limit and feel like at some point I have to cut them off, but not having the courage to do so. So the fact that all of you were were so good about the time limit, I very much appreciate. Also, I want to thank you. It's, it's kind of a, a bittersweet moment because as much as I want to thank the three panelists for excellent presentations, as I was listening to the presentations, I was also watching my screen. And it occurred to me that many of my friends are on the verge of leaving me and heading off to greener pastures in the practice of law. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank all of you for giving us so much reason to be so proud of you um, during your time at Widener. So please keep up all the good work that you all have done. Um, Brian Linson, I see that you have your hand up. So I will go to you for a question. I pressed the unmute button, did it work? It did, it did. Okay, I'm interested in the, uh, uh, the they call it a criminal conviction and voting. Um, and we had statistics of uh, uh, disenfranchised people. I've found that often the impact of law is what people believe the law is, uh, sometimes um, more so than what the law actually is. Uh, so I, I would love to see data on, um, uh, for instance, does everyone uh, know that you, know, you were convicted of a crime? Do they know that it only is a felony and not a misdemeanor? And do they know the difference between felony and misdemeanor? And so if you were to poll people in Pennsylvania, um, would they believe that because they've been convicted of a crime that they can't ever vote? Or, uh, or do, or are they, uh, what, what is the awareness that it's only as soon as you step out of behind bars from a felony conviction um, that they can vote? So maybe the number, for instance, for Pennsylvania of people who are disenfranchised by their own false beliefs uh, and lack of information is larger than um, one in three uh, African-American men, for instance. Uh, I, I have two quick observations. One, I doubt that anybody seriously weighs the consequences of not being able to vote before they, they commit a bank robbery. That would be my, my first question. <laughs> and my second question would be for uh, Professor Wiseman is, how many individuals that have committed election fraud are then allowed to vote going forward? If it's a misdemeanor. <laughs> it's a misdemeanor. If you plead to a misdemeanor, that way you get to keep your right to vote. Yeah, one, so I'm not aware of any empirical answer to that, um, but one, you know, one common thing that comes up is people as, as part of these agreements are then barred from voting in the particular jurisdiction. So I, I think there is some, you know, as you might expect, there's some sensitivity to that. I have a, a question of my own, and it, it actually kind of finds its, its roots in uh, Dean Johnson's talk. Um, Dean Johnson, at one time, you, at one point in your talk, you, you kind of broke voting into this dichotomy of fundamental right versus privilege, kind of like the Miller beer, less filling, tastes great. Um, and I wonder, it, it struck me, and, and you came back to this dynamic toward the end of your talk. I remember when I was growing up, there was like a third dynamic in that paradigm. And, and that third dynamic was that voting was a responsibility, right? And, and toward the end of your talk, you kind of raised that dynamic about, you know, if you're going to be voting or if you're going to be exercising your right to vote, then we have to be able to expect you to do that, not out of self-interest, but out of the best interest of society. And, and for me, it kind of spills into a little bit um, Professor Torres um, Spilisi's talk. Um, I wonder if there's some sort of responsibility dynamic in, in what you were observing that it's one thing to act responsibly in the election process 
and try and influence the election. It's another thing to use the opportunity to participate in the election to overwhelm the election. And, and I don't know if that, if that sort of has anything to do with what troubles you in the dynamic, but I, I wanted to throw that dynamic out to, to the three of you as, as if the observation is accurate that we've kind of lost that notion of voting being a responsibility and if there is any way to factor that in to solve some of these problems. A quick, quick observation. Is it any worse or take the person, take the vote of a, of a very affluent person voting perhaps irresponsibly to decrease taxes? Is, is, that seems to me something that's, that's really problematic. While we, we tend to focus on perhaps a convicted bank robber voting to wanting to, to limit the penalties for robbing banks. I mean, I, I, it, it just seems there's, there's really bigger problems out there, uh, just as, as sort of an observation. I mean, I think that for me, let me just follow up with, I mean, I think that that kind of goes to the core of my question is that the, the fault isn't, in the particular manner that you are irresponsible in your voting, but it is in the fact that you are being irresponsible. So that, that Dean Johnson, I would, I would say those two situations should be viewed in the same way. And I don't know if it's a voter education issue or a, a cultural issue. And that's really kind of what I'm, I'm throwing out to, to you. Um, I did have, a, I had a, a question I wanted to run by, um, uh, Professor Torres Spilisi. Um, and, and that was to go back to Watergate. One of the, the expressions in Watergate or the quotes from Watergate that I found particularly troubling, and I, I forget the individual who was testifying at the time, but one of the individuals who testified before the Senate in the, in the Watergate investigations had the observation, you guys are all kind of missing it. Because the real point here is that Nixon wanted to run against McGovern and Nixon got to run against McGovern. And, and it is an immense way of, of distorting the election process if you are able as an incumbent to choose your opponent. And I'm wondering as, as you were talking about fake candidates and hobby candidates, a lot of jurisdictions have open primaries. And while there are advantages to open primaries, it also invites the possibility that people from one party can shift over to the other party just for that primary to select a weaker candidate to run against their, their chosen candidate. And I wonder if you see that as kind of a, a similar dynamic to what you were talking about or, or that's just a very different kind of a situation. I think you're muted. I think open primaries and closed primaries are a completely different uh, aspect of election law. But uh, to the question of Watergate and um, getting Muskie out of the 72 race, uh, you know, arguably we had a, a similar attempt in 2020 uh, with the sitting president soliciting, uh, you know, dirt on his primary or likely opponent, uh, it didn't work in 2020. But one of the things that I always fear is with enough dark money, uh, with enough corporate backing, that uh, you can actually change who runs for office. And that changes the dynamics that voters are offered in the general election. So I think this is something we have to be diligent about going forward. And as with many things with the Constitution, the First Amendment and election law, there aren't easy answers. Daniel, I'm going to turn things over to you at this point. Thank you, Professor Lee. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. That concludes uh, this iteration of the Widener Commonwealth Law Review's annual symposium. I just wanted to thank all the speakers and moderators uh, that made this event possible, as well as the attendees uh, for supporting our law review. 
Uh, I wish you all the very best. Uh, thank you again and have a great rest of your day.